Am I am I looking smooth? Smooth AF, sir. <laughs> <laughs> smooth as oatmeal. Because no. oatmeal's not smooth. It's not. It's really not. That's well, a terrible analogy. Tony, um, if you notice that we freeze up or disconnect, interviews on you. Sounds good. Yeah. Right. Carry the flag for the team, but we'll and Jenga, here. as you can hear. Well, yes. you might as well just let her in. Jesus. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> She's just a member of the podcast now. Yeah. Yeah. At this point, yeah. Yeah, dude. That's I the mean, thing. She makes more noise out of the room than in the room. Right, yeah, hey, dude. She's got a. She's she, got some. Yeah, she's got some vocals. Yeah, she's like the well, Mariah Carey of cats. The funny thing is, is every time. <laughs> How dare you lock me out? Every time we've done an interview and she's been outside, as soon as someone hears her and I say, "Sorry, that's my cat," the response is always, "That's a cat." Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Jenga. Yeah, that's that's a cat. Jenga, get your questions ready. Right. We don't even like vocally talk about any of this this is all through like messaging yeah and she still knows <laughs> yeah <laughs> like how is like hmm. like at a certain point i think your cat has espn it's true <laughs> now she's just hacking your phone oh dude it's she's just equally scary <laughs> she just comes down every single time we do an interview in case it's leo right yeah, yeah. just in case yeah uh, uh, what was i gonna say <laughs> just, like a catfish <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, dude, you know what it really annoys the shit out of me is we've been like, <laughs> you know, what grinds about, my gears. Yeah, what really grinds <laughs> my gears is we've been talking about getting a projector for a while, right? And like yeah. we were talking oh, yeah, about an like outdoor projector. And I was like, all right, well, this is how we would probably have to set it up. I mean, there's no point in doing it now. It's almost August. The weather gets shitty here in the fall. Right. But like, this is what we'll need. And then, like, I hopped on the Instagram the other day and there's an ad from Amazon. And it's like projector screen, like gazebo yep. bed. And it's like, get the fuck out of here. It had man. like all like 10 different like slides of shit that we had like talked about, like misters for the porch and like little mm -hmm. Market Street light bulbs yeah, and yeah, like, yeah, like fucking a chair for the for the, you know, I was like, oh, my God. Mine is straight. Um inflatable screens for for movie projectors right now yeah um, because i used to be like the not really the president but like the over the person who organized um like an outdoor movie series every summer mm -hmm. um oh, yeah. with like a bunch of other people and i we were talking about it because it, it hasn't happened we stepped back right before covid uh, because we were going to be getting married and then um we were planning on starting to have kids and everything like that so we we're just like look we're going to call it maybe somewhere down the line. Like we'll pick it back up again if it's still going. Yeah. And then it started after COVID. Like they just started doing a series now. Mm -hmm. So Sarah and I, of course, been, have been talking about it because we were involved in it. So now mm -hmm. everything that comes up in my ads is for projectors and for inflatable screens, because we were yeah. saying like that screen they bought the previous group bought. So it's not even we didn't even buy it brand new. It was the previous group that bought it. They did it for a couple of years. And then I was on that committee and then took over that committee when they stepped back. Gotcha. And then this is like round three. So I think it's oh, like shit. 10. It's got to be at least 10 years old now. And it's an inflatable screen. So we're like, eventually it's going to need to either be replaced or seriously repaired. And then all I've been getting is ads for inflatable screens for movie projectors now. <laughs> that was so annoying. I'm like, I don't understand this shit. He's like, it's because mm. your phone listens to you because you have the microphone turned on. And I'm like, yeah, but if I turn it That's off, exactly what it is. then I can't send voice messages to like messenger and text and stuff. Because and I need to be able to do that because like, I don't want to type that shit out sometimes. That's a great thing about iPhone is you can go in and see what apps you have that are connected to the microphone and you go, nope, 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 nope. But like with Facebook Messenger and all that. But that's shit. what's listening to you. Yeah, I know that's what's listening to me. Like, because then they show up on Facebook it's, and I can't shut it off for Facebook because look, then I can't it, use it in Messenger. It grinds ah. my gears, but it's an it's a necessity <laughs> or it's a it's a very needed evil. Hey, like, I'm not going to type out all that shit I say in chat. At least we have Apple, though. Right. And they're like, like, you know, no, they're no better. They just pretend they're, they are. They're a little better. At least they listen well, though, because some sometimes you find they do listen really well. interesting stuff that you wouldn't find otherwise. <laughs> yeah, look, like their listening ability is top notch because they even know when I'm bored. They just want to show me something like Wish. And yes, I'm like, thank yeah. you. What is this? Where did those ones come yeah. from? Because 
half the shit that I see on Wish. I'm like, I've never talked about this before. I fucking know I've never talked you about this. You know what before. I think? Like, what is, like, I think one of the, the what is it, the she cup it's, thing? I know I'm what like, no, nah, I've never talked. Why are you showing me a she cup? I've never, ever talked about that Sometimes. before. I mean, now I am, but... <laughs> Sometimes they send me ads for like banana hammocks on Wish, <laughs> yeah, and then I just like, think what? it's like because Morgan's been around. Oh, you know no. what I mean. And Morgan, so my buddy Morgan just says uh, random shit. Like, yeah, we all have that one friend, right? You he's know, absolutely. That one. Yeah, and yeah. he's like, oh, dude, I got this fucking banana hammock. I'm like, dude, don't say that shit around my phone. <laughs> 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 Fuck the kids, man! Don't say that on my phone. What are you doing? In the Secret Life of Walter Mitty, he's got mm-hmm. this um, like satchel that's. Um, it looks like a, like a bag that old school sailors would have where it's got like the thick rope that goes across yeah, and yeah. you can either just sling it over your shoulder or you can actually like put it over. And it's, um, it's kind of the shape of a buoy. And I've been trying to find one because we watched the show and I was like, that's exactly what I need as far as like a backpack goes. And I couldn't find them anywhere. And every year we watch it on new year's day. So every year I tend to like start going searching for it and see if yeah. anything new has come up. And I found one on Etsy um this past january and it is exactly what i needed it's the right size it's handmade by somebody i think she lives in sweden oh, but okay. i found it i found it because of the ads because yeah. i was talking about it and i figured out what it was called because i always forget and it's called it's a ditty bag d-i-t-t-y oh. and so i went looking and because i was talking to sarah about it and because i was looking at some other places then it started populating my ads right and then i found the one that i was actually looking for yeah. yeah so it's changed like my ads used to be all for like race car parts yep and then- mine my ads were for race car <laughs> fucking parts because that's all i talk <laughs> I'm like, about I'm like, why do am i seeing all it's just it's just subi.speed or <laughs> subispeed.com or like whatever and i'm like because I'd be like, I'd just be around there. I'd be like, God, I really want to get an ECM control module. <laughs> what the fuck? I need to get a TGV g- g- delete for my fucking Subi. I'm cool. I don't yeah. want to talk about that. <laughs> and what's just shit I thought about? I don't want to see it in my feed either. I got rid of the car and then stopped talking about it. And then for a while, it was all kid shit. That's what I wasted my money on. It was yep. like ads for Hot Wheels and fucking monster trucks for Luke. And then it's it every time their birthday comes around, the ads shift a little bit because they know I'm looking for yep. shit. <laughs> and, and then, like in the last like couple of weeks, it's all been shit Karina's talked about. And I, it's like her birthday was yesterday. <laughs> like it was like fucking flowers, <laughs> fucking sparks florist. I'm like you motherfuckers. I must have bought flowers before on this date. <laughs> it's always great at Christmas because a lot of the times it'll start. I mean, obviously they're going to populate anyway, but you get a lot more of the Buzzfeed, like top 40 stocking stuffers and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, And some of them are actually like super useful and just stuff that you wouldn't think of organically. But as soon as you see it, you're like, that is absolutely something that's worth picking up. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And the fact that like, especially once you start linking everything, like I have my Apple ID linked to my email and my email linked to Amazon and so on and so forth. Yeah. And so they're like, oh, he searched for toddler 4T pants. Let's show him everything toddler. (laughs) (laughs) Everything for a toddler because he has a four year old. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, you have a nine year old. Let's show you everything fucking nine year olds can do to piss you off. Yes. (laughs) Whoa. One o'clock on the Drop. Oh, she's on it. <laughs> Hi, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Hi. Hi <laughs> How are you, Desi? I'm good. How are you guys? You're doing oh, great. Yeah, doing we good. We are like super impressed. Like I started seeing an usher because you got here right at one o'clock. Right. So <laughs> yeah, yes. like a little improvis- improvisation instead of seven o'clock on the yeah, dot. I, I love it. I love it. Well, Desi, my name's Ricky Hayes. Um, this is my wife, Karina Hayes. And then up in one of the corners is Tony Lance. Uh, we uh, we all co-host the Challenge Fandom podcast. We want to thank you so much for hopping on with us. We really do appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Um, so a little bit about us. Um, so we we go do these episodes. We call them Challengers Unplugged. In your case, it could be Survivor Unplugged as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but we want to get you away from the TV edit and talk more about what it was like behind the scenes, your experience, as well as everything else about you that the fans don't already know. Yeah. So 
Um, so Desi, I'm going to start this off pretty quick and just kind of go, um, where are you originally from? Are you from the Virginia area? Um, I'm not. So I was actually born in Alabama. And then when we were five, we moved to a small town called Peachtree City, Georgia. So I mostly grew up in Peachtree City. I moved to Virginia for college, ended up staying for grad school, ended up working there a couple of years and then moved to L.A. about five years ago. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. OK. Yeah. Um, when you were younger, I mean, obviously, I, I'm i sure some people do, but most people don't dream and say, like, I want to grow up and be on reality TV. <laughs> like, <laughs> what were your goals? What did you want to be when you were growing up? I mean, funny enough, I did start watching like Real World Road Rules Challenge as a 10 year old. Um, so there was a part of me like that didn't think like that's going to be what I do in life. But who definitely like as a 10 year old was interested in competing on a show like Real World Road Rules or which became a challenge. Right. Um, but growing up, I think initially I wanted to be a dance teacher. And <laughs> then what was next? I have like, you know, when you're a kid, you, you change what you want to do every two years, essentially. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and then going into college, I thought I would become a physician, a pediatrician specifically. Um, so, yeah, first dance teacher. Then I think like something else was animals, even though I didn't even really like animals. I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, when you're a kid, you know, like you, you meet a new cool person who's a vet and you're like, oh, I want to be a vet, even though I've never touched an animal before. So, right. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's weird how it leads you down there. Like our kids ask us or like, to, and they'll be like, what did you want to be when you grow up? I was like, well, I want to be a football player. So how did you get into air conditioning? <laughs> well, that's kind of a different story now, isn't it? <laughs> right, right. Funny how dreams don't always work out. Yeah. <laughs> so, um. You've also, you've done a lot of um, pageantry. Did you do that when you were younger as a kid as well? Or how did you start getting into beauty pageants? Um, yeah, absolutely not. I was not a pageant kid. I actually did not even own a curling iron when I did my first pageant or my second pageant for that matter. Or my oh, third wow. pageant for that matter. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, no, I did not grow up in the world of pageants. My mom actually tried to talk. Like, I started doing pageants at the age of 21. It was supposed to be like a one and done thing. And I kept doing it. And every time I talked to my mom, she'd be like, it's okay if you want to quit. Like my mom was like an <laughs> anti-quitter, but she was like, this pageant thing is really like, give it up. Um, so really <laughs> I started pageants um, as a promise to my grandmother. Um, this is kind of a long-winded story, but like you asked, well, here we, here we are. Yeah, and no we're worries. on a podcast, so yeah. we just talk, right? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> as a senior in college, again, I grew up in Georgia. I went to high school in Georgia. I went to do a college visit at Hampton University, which is in Virginia, and my mom and my grandmother came with me. Um, so it happened to be the weekend of the Miss Hampton University pageant, who kind of becomes like the school's homecoming queen, and at the time also went on to compete at Miss Virginia. So at the end of the pageant, I like looked over at my grandmother, and I was like, oh, Grandma, if I come to Hampton, I'm going to be Miss Hampton. Um, it knew, like <laughs> She didn't know that I had no intention of going to Hampton. I wanted to go to UGA. like That was the only place I wanted to go to college. Um, but fast forward, I got a full scholarship to Hampton. I ended up at Hampton. Wow. And then my junior year of college, I went home for Thanksgiving. And during Thanksgiving dinner, my grandmother approached me and was like, hey, Desi, aren't you supposed to be doing a pageant next year? <laughs> and I was like, this lady calls me my sister's name half the time. Like, how does she remember this promise I made four years ago? Um, but since she remembers, I had no choice but to like, be a woman of my word. So that yeah. was really the the only reason I followed through with the pageant was because my grandmother called me out on it. And I was like, I can't let this, can't let her down. Right. Um, so I did the pageant. She flew up to see me and the pageant and I ended up winning um, the Miss Hampton pageant. But that year was the first year that Miss Hampton was not going to Virginia. Oh. Um, so yeah, I know the competitor in me was like, well, I mean, maybe I should give it a try. Um, so I did a local pageant. <laughs> Again, like I didn't tell anybody I was competing. I told my mom the night before because um, I was in grad school at the time. And I ended up winning that pageant. I went to Miss Virginia that year and got first runner up, which was like second place. Um, and that was still in the era when like I didn't own a curling iron. So I was like, well, dang, if I can get second place, like knowing nothing, I could probably win this thing. Right. Um, so I went back the next year and won. That's kind of how my pageant career started. And then it just kind of steamrolled out of control from there. Wow, that's yeah. that's really awesome. So um, continuing to compete in the pageants, was it I know you had said like your competitiveness kicked in, but like once you had won Miss Hampton, was it like did it give you a new kind of like feeling or like really like drive to do the pageants? Like what did it feel like winning? Okay, so I mean it was obviously like 
amazing winning. I had played piano as a little girl, but then quit for a long time. Um, so I like practiced the piano ad nauseum to try to win that pageant. So obviously it was like <laughs> a big success for me to win. But truthfully, I planned to end there. But there was a woman who worked on campus who like kept nagging me about doing another pageant, like wouldn't give it a rest. Mm. So at that time, the Miss America pageant had like no entry fee. So you could just like show up and compete. Um, so she was like, you already have the wardrobe from the pants and like just come and give it a try. Yeah. So I, I really just wanted to like get her off my back. And, yeah. and that's really <laughs> what like made me do my second pageant. It's just like, if I, if I don't do it, this woman will never stop honoring me. Let me just do this pageant. Like I have nothing to do this week in any way. Um, and that's sort of how that happened. But then once I got to Miss Virginia and realized that I could be competitive, like across, you know, amongst all of these women, then I, then I had the bug and the competitor in me was like, I got to win. Like I, I, you know, I can't got leave it. her being second place. Yeah. Oh, I love it. That's, That's so awesome. Cool. I, I like how it kind of all happened by like circumstances as far as like a conversation with your grandmother and three years later it turns in like <laughs> so what happened to that automatic entry into Miss USA or Miss Virginia <laughs> <laughs> right right and that's really how it happened I mean eventually I started to enjoy it and yeah but mostly it was like the competitor to me was like I gotta do it right you know I can't I keep like the end of my story cannot be second place so let me just make it first place that's awesome so I I do have a question about this and and I find it odd that I have a question about pa pageantry, but now I do. So I need to know more. Um, sure. And Karina asked this earlier, and I made an assumption I don't know, but it said that you were named Miss Virginia and then Miss Virginia USA. And what's the difference between those two? Uh, well, it depends on who you ask. Uh, so I, I'm going to give you like the non politically correct answer first, and then I'll give you like, you know, politically correct answer. <laughs> um, so how it was described to me when I was, you know, determining like which system um, is I was told that Miss America is like the girl next door. And like, if you squint your eyes and turn your head to the side, you'd be like, well, I guess, I guess she's a pretty girl. Um, so that's, but it's a scholarship competition. They're always going to lead with that. Right. Yeah. Whereas Miss USA um, is a pageant that's like face, body, hair in that order. And those are like the three most important components. Um, so I would say that's more somewhat, but if you look at the two, like the Miss America pageant is one where you have to have a talent. Um, and now they've taken out their swimsuit competition and you've got like a platform that you go and do all these public appearances to speak on behalf of your platform. So the Miss America competition always says we're a scholarship organization. They don't like to call themselves a pageant. Whereas I would say Miss USA is more like a pageant. Like it's okay to be sexy and it's okay to be fun. And God, we're going to wear a tiny bikini on stage. Right. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and I apologize if I didn't catch this earlier. You said you end up going to um, Hampton University. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Hampton University. Yeah. What did What was your major while you were there? Um, my undergraduate degree is actually in health and physical education. So I had a degree to teach health and PE for a long time. Wow, wow. that's because you were previously a college professor too, weren't you? At some point. I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my under my, my my major was health and PE. My minor was leadership studies. Um, so after I finished with my doctorate degree, I came on staff first as like a lab assistant kind of professor in the physical therapy department. Okay. And then I got promoted to become the director of the Leadership Institute, which is kind of the program that oversaw wow. minor in leadership studies. Wow. <laughs> I'm sorry if you hear that in the background. That's our fourth that's podcast member. Yeah, Jenga. <laughs> Wait, that's a cat? Yeah, yeah, that's my cat. She's only about like this big, but she normally comes on to our recaps on Friday nights. So whenever that door is shut, she takes it as a personal offense. Yes. Right. She's like, yeah. Hello, yeah. I'm the star. How are you doing yeah. the show without me? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. exactly like, what it is. <laughs> you are obviously in danger, so I will sit out here and sing the song of my cat people. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. So they know I'm still here. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's showing solidarity is what that is. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's pretty good. I'm surprised our cat hasn't started already. I know, right? <laughs> um, now, you said you had gotten a full ride. Was that through like athletics that you originally were getting? Uh, no, it was an academic scholarship. Oh, um, that's... So back then they had like scholarships based on basically test scores. So I got a scholarship based on my ACT score. Wow. Oh, that's so awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> so, um, and now y you said you went through and got your doctorate and now in, if I'm correct, it's in physical therapy and rehabilitation. Is that correct? 
Yeah, some physical therapy, correct. Wow. Now I I took really like basic entry high school, like physical therapy, like where you learn like ROM stands for range of motion. And that's a, about as far as we got into it, but thank you. Thank you. I, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I brushed up. I, I brushed up before the podcast, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> Opened up that old textbook. <laughs> oh yeah. Blew the dust off and everything. Um, so I guess my question was, is, did you find a passion in physical therapy? Is that, or did it just kind of happen? You just fell into it? Yeah, I, I, I did. So I'll kind of explain sort of how I discovered physical therapy. So I initially wanted to be a physician. Um, and then when I, I, I kind of changed my mind, but I tore my ACL twice in high school. So I went through mm-hmm. a ton of physical therapy, um, like a ton of physical therapy. And all I felt like my physical therapist just like she was super talkative. All she did was talk, 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 and tell me what to do. So she'd talk like my ear off, and she'd be like, "Okay, go do ten of those." And then she talked my ear off again. And be, and like so, she was just talking and bossing me around for Ugh. an hour. Yeah, and I was like, "Oh, well, this seems like a great job. Like I just get to talk and tell people what to do. Like <laughs> <laughs> does, it, does it get better than that?" Um, so that's really kind of what sparked my interest in physical therapy was kind of that experience. Um, and then on top of that, my like main sport in high school was cheerleading, but obviously like I had a torn ACL, I couldn't cheer at the time. Um, but I started coaching our special Olympics cheerleading team and wow. kind of through that experience was also able to see like how just being a part of a team sport and being part of something physical really helped those athletes, like not just physically, but it also helped them you know, socially and and mentally and emotionally. So it really kind of clicked in my head that there was a bigger connection between like mind and body and and wellness. Um, So I'd say like all of those experiences combined is kind of what led me to the fellow physical therapy. Wow. That's that's awesome. And it's so true. I mean, you know, seeing it's one of the like, I, I sorry, it's long story by me, even though I'm not the one being interviewed. Um, I'll make it really quick. My dad always put in me like you need to play you need to play team sports because it teaches you more than just the sport in the long run. Right. You learn teamwork and social, you know, negotiating with teammates and people working with people you might may not like in the long run. So yes, very true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, certainly a lot of good life skills learned in team sports. So I'm, yeah, I, I wish all kids would play them, but now like esports are thing, so they don't have to. But Right. <laughs> so uh, just to kind of give you the heads up, Tony is like our resident survivor expert. I'm surprised he doesn't have the buff like actually on right now. Is it on your wrist? No, it's, I've got a couple buffs back here. I unfortunately, so I live in Canada and we have very limited access to survivor buffs. Um, you can't buy them from the Ooh. CBS store um, because they don't ship to Canada. Uh, so I've had to get them like by way of people ordering them for me and then setting them down. So I have a very <laughs> random mix. Unfortunately, to date, I don't have any from Heroes Hero, Heroes Hustlers yet. Mm-hmm. Unforgivable. Right. Mm. We're gonna <laughs> have to him immediately. Right. No, no healers buff for me, unfortunately. <laughs> no worries. I don't take it personally. I'm not sure if I know where mine is right now. <laughs> Any consolation. I, I've been telling him for like six months. I was like, oh, yeah, those are really cool. I should get one. I haven't got I one yet. Forget, yeah, yeah, I keep so forgetting. About it. Yeah, I keep forgetting about it. They do come in handy. Like when I go skiing, I'll usually wear one, you know, like to protect my face from the elements. Um, oh, they yeah. do come in handy, but, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, once, once you have a few, you have them all. Yeah, I was telling Tony, I was like, I definitely can't do what some of the girls do on Survivor and wear it as like a halter top. I don't think that'll work. <laughs> I mean, you'd be surprised how stretchy those things are. Right? Well, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but um, leading into this question is, um, were you always like a big fan of Survivor as well as you were with the challenge? Yeah. Um, I was not a big fan of Survivor. I can't oh. even, I, I almost hate to like say that out loud to Survivor fans because <laughs> they hate it. I know there's people who applied their whole life and never gotten on Survivor. Um, I probably watched the first couple of seasons of Survivor and then like did not watch Survivor. Um, so actually I it was quote unquote recruited. A casting director reached out to me in like a Facebook inbox message. Um, they found my, he found me on the like Miss USA webpage. So I guess that's oh, yeah. one positive thing that came out of pageants and just sent me like a cold message. And it was kind of in like my like other inbox. I don't know if you guys know about that on. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. So like you get the, I just go there like for pure entertainment typically. Like when I was doing pageants, people would ask for like shoes and like weird stuff. 
I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was only by half a chance that I even went into my other inbox that day, but I read a message and I was like, is this legit? Is this another weirdo trying to get a video of me? Mm-hmm. Um, but I like researched the guy, he was legit. And that was kind of what spurred the, the survivor thing. Was that wow. Method? So was it for like a CBS cat? Was it one of like the CBS casting ones where it could have been like Big Brother or Amazing Race or Survivor? Or was it specifically for Survivor? It was specifically for, for Survivor. Yeah. Wow. I don't know that I would have. I don't know if there's any amount of money that could get me to do a Big Brother. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a <laughs> lot. Big Brother's a yeah. lot. <laughs> Big Brother is a lot. Yeah. yeah. A lot, a lot. Like, um, it's really set up for that 18 to 21. Like I can live in a dorm with complete strangers. Yes. So that's fine. Like once you hit like 25, it's like, uh, I can't do that. I don't want to do that. Anymore. Yeah. Especially not for like a hundred days. Like I might be able to do it for a couple of weeks. Yeah. yeah. A month at most, but like right. three months, you guys are out of your mind. There's oh my gosh. <laughs> so I was actually curious. Um, you went into survivor you guys you first of all you absolutely kicked ass in survivor like i think you guys your tribe won like the first two or three again tony's stats and info but um the first like two or three uh immunity challenges and then you won the first immune individual immunity challenge right out the gate so what was the what was the experience like of being on the island with on survivor with all those people oh it's a mixed bag of feelings um i was like my first tribe i love so the healers original tribe like people were probably sick of us because yeah we, we want everything but also we were just having like a really good time online yes. so there was never a moment when i was on the healers tribe where i was hungry like we, we had a decent amount of food i really enjoyed the people i slept great every night we'd like stay up late telling stories and we'd give each other back rubs before we went to sleep like we were it was like it was kind of sickening, but it was like an adult <laughs> summer camp. Like I loved oh being on the gosh. healer tribe. So much fun. Um, until we swapped. And then uh, <laughs> after that, it was like everything went downhill. I got to a new island. On this island, the water was like, gosh, it felt like a mile away. Um, there were crazy people on my tribe. There was drama. <laughs> there was no food. We were starving. Um, and I, yeah, I remember literally going like 36 hours without like a more, like there were no coconuts left all there was was water we were all uh, like on the edge of death and i looked at a producer and i was like if i don't get food in the next 24 hours like i'm gonna have to quit like i'm just not yeah <laughs> it's, this is not that important to me right um, yeah. luckily <laughs> like the next day was the merge and it was all fine um so it was a mixed bag of emotions like first i loved it then i hated it and then i got to another point where i was like oh, this is, i guess i can do this again because i had a full belly um yeah and then the backstabbing starts yeah and so i mean it was tough but i will say i think i was in a better position than a lot of people because so many people had invested so much of their life into getting on this show that like they really took it personally when they were voted out like it was like real personally like probably are still mad to this day or like to a certain extent upset wow. about something that happened oh, um whereas i feel like i very quickly kind of moved on like obviously i was upset there were people who voted me out that i felt like i thought i was in an alliance with um right. but at the end yeah. of the day i feel like i overall had a positive experience yeah i was just gonna ask like i know when you swapped you swapped with joe and i know that you were friends with joe but i also know that joe from the edit at the very least can be a lot at times <laughs> what was it like sitting there knowing that you had two of you and you had the two heroes and you had Devin, and then joe just starts and antagonizing everybody and you know that this is a crucial vote and you were not yet privy to him having an idol no i actually think i knew did i know he had an idol i can't remember if i knew he had an idol but either way i was like it's his idol it's not my idol yeah right Um, so i actually recently like went back and watched that i'm my boyfriend had never seen it so i was like well one of his friends watched it he felt forced to watch it Uh, so (laughs) we watched it together um and it brought up a lot of old emotions yeah that was a tough, like, that was a tough day for me um, because I trusted Joe so much up until that point, And then it felt like he was betraying me. Like, he, yeah, he yeah. created, like, yeah, he created a storm, like, just like that. It's like he snapped and all of a sudden everybody's mad. And now I felt like I was a target. So um, I was obviously pissed. Um, <laughs> but there was also a part of me that Joe was like, oh, well, I could always play my idol for you. I'm going to play it in a moment. Mm-hmm. 
And for some reason, there was also part of me that trusted Joe's instincts. I'm trying to remember there was an instance before that where like Joe's instincts were spot on. And I, and I can't remember the specific example, but there was something where I was like, this man is crazy, but I think it's like calculated crazy. Like I, um, I, I almost feel like he was like getting information from like a higher power that he just like, <laughs> right. I don't know. Like he knew what to do in the moment. So while I was pissed, I was also just like, I have to trust that his gut is correct. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and when he says that, like, I'll either play the idol for me or play it for you, depending upon like how I feel like things play out at tribal council. I was also part of me that just trusted that he would have good judgment in, in that time. And he did. Right. Yeah. He, yeah. he was like, yeah, he was like, I'm going to play it for myself because I right. think it's me who they voted for. And he happened to be right. Yeah. That time around. Yeah. <laughs> So I have a question that's a little bit broader about Survivor and it's because I'm kind of like the newbie when it comes to it. How long is it between like tribals on average, like time wise? On average, I would say maybe like three to four days, mm-hmm. but it okay. kind of, it kind of varies. Like on the challenge, it's a very specific schedule. Like mm-hmm. this day, every week you have a challenge. This day, every week you have an elimination. This day, every week is your off day. Um, but on Survivor, it kind of like ebbs and flows. So I don't know how they determine how many days but sometimes you'd have a challenge every two days and sometimes it'd be like four days and you have nothing to do wow um, so it kind of yeah i don't know how they create that schedule i mean i obviously have no insight on this but i was gonna be like it's because of jeff it's jeff's schedule he's like you know i'm gonna take a couple days off let him chill no big deal i mean maybe <laughs> maybe yeah yeah there's something i really want to do in downtown pg it's only a hop skip and a way to get there so yeah right, right. <laughs> um so in that in that final tribal where you unfortunately got voted out which by the way i was also very pissed i was like i feel like she was not here very long even though you were there for like more than half of the season but i was like i want more desi um but it, if i remember correctly it was it was a tie um, and then you guys went for a revote, and then unfortunately you were the one voted out. What do you think was the ultimate like factor in them deciding that it was to send you instead of Joe? Uh, so I actually truthfully think that most of the tribe could have gone either way. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like I went into that tribal council knowing it was me or Joe. So going into vote, I, I also in the back of my head knew I could write down Joe's name and keep myself in the game. Um, but also we were at a point in the game where Joe was the only person I 100% trusted. Like Jess had gone home to vote before me. She was kind of my like other number one. But once she was there, I was like, I want to trust Cole and Dr. Mike, but also their wild cards. Like I trust that Joe has my back. Right. Um, so I just couldn't bring myself to write his name down because I also knew like I write his name down today and I'm gone next vote. Like what difference does it make? Right. Um, but I like to believe that it was just the idea that like, Physically, they found me as a threat. Like, potentially, I could have won another individual immunity and then stayed in the game longer and longer and longer. Yeah. Um, although we've seen the game of Survivor time and time again, like, physical threats don't win the game of Survivor. Like, that's not how it works. Right. Um, but they always seem to be early targets. So I like to think that that's why I was voted out, just because they wanted to get me out when they could. And they didn't know, like, what other challenges I would win. But who knows? Yeah, I was going to thought too. I was going to say kind of like two parts. Like one, I've noticed, like you were saying, and it's no secret that physical threats usually typically go home pretty early in Survivor. Yeah. yeah. Where in other shows like Challenge or, you know, Big Brother, they have so many opportunities to physically like get out of that, whether it be in mm-hmm. Big Brother with the veto or with Challenge. You, if you physically can't beat that person, they're not going home. Right. Right. Um, but Survivor, it's typically on the vote. And that's a notice. Another thing that I've kind of noticed is. It seems like going to tribal, it's a fall of a domino and it's either going to go one way or the other. And whichever way that one person decides to go, it seems like the whole tribe just hops on that real quick because, you know, that's the way the the tribe wants to vote. Right. Right. Um, right. And it's a game where you don't want to, like, piss anybody off. You know, you don't want to see yeah. seem to be like you're the one person going against the alliance because then you become the target and there's no way to defend yourself once you become the target. So. It is a different kind of structure where, yeah, if you're the target, you're gone. And that is what it is. God, I would be so trash at that. <laughs> like, I'd piss somebody <laughs> off so quick. Would, yeah, yeah. It's it's would absolutely. It's tough not to piss people off. Yeah, yeah. Especially living in that close of quarters and for that long. And then you have all those, like, irritable factors added on of being hungry, being thirsty, being tired, being hot, being 
whatever, sandy, like whatever it is. You know what I mean? Like that's what would drive me nuts is the sand everywhere. Like I could not deal with that. And <laughs> there's that huge generational gap too, right? Like yeah. you have such a range from like either late teen, early twenties to 50, 60 plus in certain seasons. And that's just, that's yeah. a hard dynamic to try to cover and all of that. And it just more credit to you for even being able to make it, you know, to like the 60 percent mark is i think is about yeah. where it was in the season yeah, i mean i'm not great with math i'm like just that. throwing numbers out so um, <laughs> yeah that sounds about right <laughs> yeah but i mean like because looking at it like from my perspective i'd be like i'm gonna be the first one sent home because someone's gonna say something be like what the hell are you talking about kind of thing yeah <laughs> yeah and truthfully as someone who like wasn't a hardcore survivor fan i was like i just cannot be the first person to go home right because um, yeah. also you take you know a month and a half off of your life and so yeah. Whether you're the first vote out or the last vote out, like you're a month and a half of your life is, is dedicated to the show. Um, so yeah, for me, it was like once I got past that, I was like, I'd love to make it to the end of this game, but also like I'm not going to beat myself up if I become the target. Right, right, right. So I'm I'm actually curious. I had I sorry I had no, another no, 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 survivor question really quick. Um, looking back on. Uh, your survivor experience was there like a challenge or anything that you really enjoyed doing or that like sticks out to you still to this day i loved all of the challenges like yeah. i <laughs> that's really what i lived for which is going and doing you know the competitions like that's what i looked forward to um i mean there's one that sticks out in my head but it's only because i i feel like that was like the turning moment for me where people like realized i was a good well there were maybe two one was a challenge where we had to like take these rice bags and we had to carry them across the balance beam. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, people were like struggling with it. And for whatever reason, maybe it's like my cheerleading background. I don't know, but it was like pretty simple for me. Yeah. And I remember Jeff like saying in the moment, like Debbie making this look easy. Yeah. And for me, I was like, Jeff, you were like, nobody else knows. Like everybody else is just struggling <laughs> through their challenge. Nobody sees me making this look easy. Like just let me perform in peace. Just um, so Jeff, I feel like shush. that. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, shut up. <laughs> yeah. Record this in post. Like, right. why are you doing this right now? Um, so that was kind of the time one where I was like, uh, this is easy for me, but also like Jeff is pulling up my spot. And then there was a second challenge that I think was most memorable just because of like how wild it was and how crazy it looked afterwards, where we kind of had to do like the worm through the sand. So we yes. had our hands attached to us. Um, there was like sand all over my face. Also another challenge that I was like, I'm not sure why Ryan is struggling so much because it really isn't that hard right um, but also like something that was memorable be memorable because i remember how much other people struggled and i was just like no it's not that hard guys like right? i'm not sure what technique you're using right now but <laughs> <laughs> no that's that's definitely the one i think of too like that's that's <laughs> the one that i think that i think is probably my favorite one like i loved watching that competition <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And, and it was fun. It was fun to do as well. Obviously, that was one where there was sand everywhere. everywhere. Like, for days, I feel like after that, we all had sand everywhere. But. <laughs> well, you had like a sand mask by the end of it because yeah. you just went right into the sand yeah. right out of the gate. I mean, I felt like that was the only way, right? I was like, oh, I can yeah. do the worm. Like, I can make this happen. But uh, that's the other crazy thing is like, I watched that back. And even after we got the reward and went back to camp and there was still sand all over my face. And I'm like, why didn't anybody stop to tell me like, hey, Desi, like, why don't you just rinse your face in the ocean real quick? Like, why wouldn't somebody have said that in that yeah. moment? You know yeah. what I mean? Like, obviously, I can't see what I look like. So help me. Help me. Not look yeah. crazy. <laughs> <laughs> after survivor uh you know obviously we are now seeing you now on challenge usa but what were you kind of doing in between there were you just working or what was going on in between survivor and you starting challenge usa um i mean the biggest thing i would say was i moved to la so at the time when i filmed survivor i was working as a professor at hampton um and actually there was a moment like while i was on i could have challenged i'm gonna say survivor um, there was a moment while I was on Survivor where I remember us like sitting around the campfire and talking with all these spring and feel on that show was taught. Um, and I remember people like kind of reflecting back on life and work. And I feel like it was Joe who said like, oh, I, I hate those knuckleheads at work, but like part of me just can't wait to like get back and see them, like see those knuckleheads that normally get on my friggin' nerves. And I remember yeah. thinking to myself, like, I would rather like this island isn't so bad. Like I'd rather be starving on this island than <laughs> go back and like do my everyday life which is crazy like I wasn't living a bad life I certainly had a good position had a good career trajectory but I think deep down inside like I just was not happy um 
I, I felt very much constricted being in Virginia and working at a university in a small town. Like I felt like I couldn't go out and be me and have fun uh, without running the students. Right. So I got back from Survivor in May and then in August, like put in my kind of notice that I was quitting. And then in late July, maybe it was August, I don't remember which month, I moved to LA. Mm. So just like with two suitcases, wow. like into an empty apartment. But I was just like, there's no reason that I should be 27, like with all the opportunity in the world, but being unhappy. Um, yeah. So yeah. So in that time, I moved to LA. A lot has happened since then. I, you know, worked for a big company for a while. Since then, I started my own company, um, like a mobile physical therapy company. Uh, I'm starting dating a guy. I've moved in with the guy. So life. Wow. Has, yeah, life has changed a lot. I did not know that there would be more reality TV for me in my future, but so thank so, goodness here I am. Right. No, we're thankful to have you on. Um, <laughs> So you were saying, you know, kind of going back to that discussion, sitting around the fire um, on Survivor, was that kind of what made you realize that you didn't want to stay in Virginia and stay at Hampton University anymore? Was that kind of that moment for you? Yeah, it was, yeah, it was in that moment for me, only because I knew like, like I'm 20, I didn't, I guess I didn't realize that I was unhappy until I was in a circumstance where like, I should be miserable, like I should be my most miserable sitting around this campfire starving with no shelter on an island right but it actually felt in a lot of ways more fun and more comfortable than my everyday life yeah um, yeah so for me it was just like why would I continue to do something like that's insanity right continue to do the same thing and expect me a different result so yeah. Yeah. I love it I love that you just said you know what f it and picked up and and went and found what what made you happy I think that's great yeah um, so Speaking of the challenge, um, did I know that you were a challenge fan. Did they reach out to you or did you reach out to them? Like, how did the casting process go for Challenge USA? Yeah, so they reached out to me. Um, so I, I don't want to, like, purport to be a super fan. I was, <laughs> I was definitely, like, a huge challenge fan as a kid. Yeah. Like, when I wasn't allowed to watch some TV, I think part of the allure was, like, it was forbidden. So I'm going to watch some TV and my mom's not looking. Yep. Um, <laughs> but I would say by the time I was, like, allowed to watch some TV in, like, high school, college, like, I did not watch TV that much. I wasn't a huge challenge fan. I'd catch it if I caught it, but it wasn't like I got to sit down and watch it right. every week at this time. So I just don't want to, like, be a faker. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, of course, I knew the challenge, and it was kind of like a childhood dream of mine. So when they reached out to me, obviously, I was like ecstatic, um, shocked, like I still am shocked that they found me and to play, you know, amongst the Tysons and the Sarah Lucinas of the world. Yeah. Um, I can't even remember the question now because I've just been rambling. But <laughs> yeah, I, I was excited, but they definitely reached out to me, which I think is what they did um, mostly for everyone. Maybe I would, not, I don't know. I, I would assume so on like the Challenge USA because you guys are all yeah. fairly established either in your professional life or in your television right. life, right. however yeah. you want to put it. Um, where did you did you ever get reached out to by MTV to be on the actual MTV challenge? So I actually did. Um, kind of during like the height of COVID, I, I did get reached out to be on the on the MTV version. I went through the casting and like we were kind of close, and then there were just parts of the contract that I. At the time, it just didn't feel like the right step for me. I just started the business. It would take me away from the business too long. And I felt like the gain, but like the benefit did not weigh the potential harm. Um, so yeah, MTV did reach out to me first and it was a no-go. Ooh, time. that's interesting. I wonder if it was for the season that they brought Jay and Natalie on for a total, what was that? Was that Total Madness or was that? Yeah, it was Total Madness. No, that was they Double Agents. Double Agents. For the one in Iceland. Oh, yeah. I want to say it was the season. No, actually, I do think it was that one because I uh, I don't It was either that one or the season after that. But maybe right. it was that one. Yeah. I remember talking to Natalie briefly about <laughs> it, but I can't remember if it was like, I, yeah, I think it which was that one it was. Yeah. Yeah. And I was actually going to because ask this because I've it seems like it's pretty much the same in every one of these shows. It's almost like a, a fraternity or a sorority to be to belong to it. Right. So have you like, you know, started relationships with uh, people of Survivor of other seasons like Natalie or Jay or, you know, I mean, there's a hundred I could list right now. Right? I know. There's millions of them. Yeah. I, yeah. I have a, I think my closest relationship with, with Bryce from Kagayan 
Um, he and I are like, he was actually on my, I don't know, I guess not He was like on my contact list while I was on the challenge. So you get to like call home for 10 minutes twice a week. So oh, he that's was so actually cool. on, like one of the three people on my contact list other than my mom and my boyfriend. Um, so I'd say Bryce I'm closest with, but I also did this like survivor kind of charity trip with um, Wendell and Ramona and Bob Crowley from like whatever season that was a million years ago, Jimmy <laughs> P. Um, so yeah, I've got a, I've got a decent relationship with quite a few survivors, but I'd say Bryce is like the one I'm tightest with. And then I'm obviously like social with many others. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's like, you know, a working relationship, right? You know, you, you don't know everybody in the corporation, but you'd say hi when you walk past them on the hallway, yeah. right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Happy to see them, happy to hang out with them, but like the only person I'm really seeking out time spent with is, is probably Bryce. I don't blame you. Like, I listen to his and Wendell's podcast, and they're hilarious. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Bryce is just, like, the best. And that's why I put him on my contact list, because I knew that there would be moments where I'm like, I just need a breath of fresh air and a reason to smile. So Yeah. yeah that's Bryce in a nutshell. Yeah. Yeah. That is Bryce <laughs> in a nutshell. And, like, he's always going to, I mean, obviously, you know, he's a human, so he's other emotions, yeah. too. But, but when you need to pick me up, like, Bryce is always there. So... With you being a fan of the challenge when you were younger and now, obviously, I'm sure when you uh, got the call about coming on the challenge USA, you probably did a little bit of research and watched some previous seasons, I'm assuming. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, you, you don't come across as a person who doesn't know what they're getting into <laughs> and, and just walk into it blindly. So um, watching back, um, you know, do you have certain favorite players from the flagship that you enjoy watching now? Uh, I would so I mean obviously like Laurel the challenge beast so she's somebody who I enjoy watching but also like would be terrified of as a <laughs> fellow contestant um, I would say preparing like when I was working out and my work and like say that he trained me whatever we worked out <laughs> together like probably five times <laughs> but if it makes you feel good like we'll, we'll, we'll continue to tell that story um, right. <laughs> but I'd always be like do you think I'm better at this than Car Maria like <laughs> do, you, do you think I could be Cara Marie at this? Right. Um, so she kind of became like my target. Like, am I strong enough? Am I doing this hard enough? Um, so I'd say Cara Marie also, like, while some of her, like, drama has kind of has been annoying in the past, like, mm -hmm. her as a competitor is obviously undeniable. Oh, yeah. Um, and then obviously there's the old school players, you know, the, the Wesses of the world that I remember watching as a kid and the CTs and the Johnny Bananas that, you know, have been dominating the game for a literal decades. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. It's <laughs> ridiculous. I, I, I've yeah. told this one a couple of times, but like when we first met, uh, this was back in like 2015. Something. Yeah, something like that. Oh. Um, <laughs> but uh, I came over one night and she's like, and I was talking to her. She's like, shut up. I'm watching my show. And I was like, what show is it? And she's like, the challenge. I was like, you mean like real world road rules MTV challenge? She's like, yeah. I was like, oh, is Darrell and... And mm -hmm. Veronica and Rachel, she's like, no, not really anymore. <laughs> but, <laughs> but surprise, now they're back. Now yeah, they're exactly. Back. <laughs> so I got back into it and I've been hooked ever since. I end up, it was, I think it was the season that Bananas stole the money from Sarah. So like, Rebel that's like you. hook, line and sinker. I was, I was mm -hmm. sold right there. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a compelling show. Even, yeah, when we started watching it, like in preparation for me leaving, it was kind of like a balance. Because one, we don't watch a ton of TV, like usually it's like an hour a night. Um, so there was a balance of like wanting to feel prepared, but also not wanting to be freaked out by the <laughs> crazy stuff they were making them do on the challenge. Yeah. So there were nights where I was like, I, I can't watch tonight. Like I was just thinking of mental place where I was like, I, I could die on this show. Like this, I, am I going to make it out alive? Like, so. Yeah, it's like, can we just watch Full House tonight or something? Right. You know, yeah, just right. some chill. You know, yeah. that's something funny. That's, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> doesn't make me feel like there's impending doom. <laughs> Going on to uh, the the challenge USA. Um, obviously, like you know, they they have a challenge format layout. But we kind of have been feeling like they're bringing in kind of like little pieces and remnants from the other shows, like. Um, the, I can't remember if it was episode two or three, but you guys did the daily where you had to stand on the little plank and hold the bar with the weights, that you know, and have your, three. was it three? three. Okay. Yeah. Three. Um, and that reminded me so much of a, of a survivor type game, but like with a challenge elevation kind of thing by putting you guys up in the air to do it. So I'm just curious, um, you know, obviously up to this point, we've only seen, um, the first four episodes, but 
Has there been one of the challenges that you've done so far that you really enjoyed doing? And then was there one that you were like, no, I don't want to do this? Oh, in the ones you've seen so far, like, did I enjoy doing any of them? Right. Um, so They've all been like admitted- repelling off buildings right. and shit. Right, right. So, exactly. So admittedly, I am afraid of heights. Um, obviously, I overcome that fear. And, I, you know, I'm bungee jumped. I've never skydived. That still terrifies the crap out of me. Um, Don't but watch yeah, I'm afraid of heights. So, I know. Well, I, I yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know i know yeah exactly um, oh my god i don't even want to think of it yeah i don't like to think about skydiving um everything terrified me so repelling down the side of the building terrifying but even more terrifying was trivia last week where you're just gonna free fall drop me like yeah through uh, not to mention like i feel like people it was not as portrayed as scary as it was but like the platform through which we fell was so narrow they're like over and over again during safety they were like make sure your arms are across your chest girls put your hair in a button like yeah. don't wave your arms around because truly if you had like you're hitting the side of that and then who like now you dislocated oh, yeah. your shoulder like yeah. yeah now you've got a cervical spine injury like so that was terrifying and then on top of that it was raining and it was windy that day so yeah the, the buoy challenge I am so grateful to CBS that they did not show my worst moments during that challenge, but I took some hard falls into that water. Like, oh. thought I was drowning at times. Like, you, you see James, like, yell out, and I, yeah. like, I felt that in my soul because I had a similar <laughs> feeling during that challenge. Um, so I'd say, like, the easiest challenge up to this point was, you know, the hangman challenge. And we right. all had, you know, that height element where... And after it was done, it was like, oh, I guess that wasn't so bad. Right. Um, but in the moment, I was terrified. The challenge does love their heights. So, <laughs> yeah. And that's got to be hard. Like you're falling, like, especially in that hangman one, or it wasn't the hangman. It was, um, it, was it was the knowledge. buoy. Yeah. Yeah. Buoy. Oh, wait, wait. Oh, yeah, buoy. Yeah. yeah. The buoy one. Um, oh, yeah. It's got to be hard because you're falling and it's not like landing in water is like landing in a pillow. It still hurts. Yeah. And then you're trying to like get up and climb the ladder and the whole time you got TJ probably laughing at you for falling. <laughs> you know, So it's like mm-hmm. it's two injuries, one to your body, one to your pride. And it's it's got to be tough. And so I commend you guys to do that because like lesser people will be like, you know, fuck this. I'm done. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? <laughs> Um, it's the pride that gets you going back up every time. Yeah, because there was certainly a moment where I was like, Ugh, like gasping for air. Like, is oh, this yeah. where I, am, I, am I drowning? Like, am I drowning? But yeah, it's your pride that's like, yeah, I can't give up. I got to climb this ladder. I can't let my teammate down. And that right. week, like, Danny was my teammate. I've got a former NFL player. Like, he was probably excited to, me, excited to have me as a partner. And here I am drowning in shallow water. You know what I mean? So <laughs> <laughs> I had to keep going. So <laughs> that alone. I wanted to bring this up since you brought up with you, you and Danny being partners. Um, I put it out in one of our groups, like that we were going to be speaking with you today. And if anybody had any questions and like the resounding, like question that we got was somewhat challenge related, but do you know Danny's wife's name and how much did he talk about her? Not in confessionals when you guys are actually up there. (laughs) Of course I know Danny's wife's name. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Kiki, I'm sure is like, so I've also met her since, like he came to LA for a weekend. We all went and got friends together and hung out all day. So I've also oh, met cool. Kiki and she's a lot of fun. Um, but we all certainly knew Danny's <laughs> wife, like from the get go. He, yeah. My, like, he didn't just say my wife, Kiki in confessionals. Like okay. he talked about his wife, Kiki constantly, which like, Aww. I hope I've got a man who's out in the world, like right? talking about me nonstop. Like it's a great thing, but I'd never seen anything like it before i had to like rack my brain like what's tyson's wife's name again like what dom like what did he say with his wife's name but like we all knew danny Kiki is danny's wife <laughs> and, and also like danny is not going to cross kiki the wrong way like that's something that was also very clear that was like kiki is the boss oh, right yeah. <laughs> well we were saying the other day like with all the advice she's given him you know she needs to write a book and like that's like how yes. to win like at or like how to win at life by kiki or something yeah. like to that effect <laughs> Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm sure she's going to eat that up. Yeah, if, if I don't, don't see them on Amazing Race in the next, like, two years, I would be shocked at this point because, yeah, yes. she is, it's actually funny because, and this is, I'm sorry to David for, like, saying it that loud, but I, we were talking about, like, just having conversation after we watch one of the episodes, and we usually watch some other challengers, and David's name came up, and my boyfriend was like, who's David? 
But he knows who Kiki is. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> she's, getting, she's getting a three hundred amount of airtime. So I'd be yeah. shocked if we don't see her on TV some, <laughs> at some point in the near future. And she's a character. Like, she would make a really she is. good television. Oh, we, she's so much fun. We were keeping track of how much she's been mentioned in like confessionals in the show. And it's like if we're going by confessional count, she's qualified to run the final already. Yeah. 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 <laughs> truly. Truly. She's got more confessionals than most of us. At yeah. This point, so. <laughs> so, yeah. Props to Kiki. Like she's doing something right at home because that man will not stop talking about her. I love to, it. To go from one of your co-stars wife to another co-star that brings something up all the time. How was it being partnered with Leo? Oh, Leo. So I was okay, like I had a good week to be partners with Leo. Um, I didn't mind Leo so much. Like, I feel like he rubs a lot of the girls the wrong way and, and did in the house. But I always kind of like Leo. Like, I do think he's a smart guy. He's running really successful businesses out here yeah. in Southern California. So, like, I always had a certain amount of respect for Leo. Obviously, he talks about his cats too much. That kind of <laughs> that, that killed me. You're confessional <laughs> yeah. on that. Like, one time. That's enough. No more. <laughs> we get the point. You love your cat. Like, not to mention his cat is named after him. Like, his right. cat is also named Leo. The other one's Leo. Like, all oh right. Oh, my God. That is so great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it doesn't make any sense. Um, but I didn't mind Leo. And I... I, I think he's a nice guy. I think he's a hardworking guy. I think there were times in the house where maybe he was not attuned to how he was coming off socially, but overall, like, I had nothing but positive things to say about Leo. Aw, I love that. And I've met his cats, and they are pretty cute. So. Well, you know. <laughs> I respect the cat talk. It was the stopping to take his shoes and socks off oh before gosh. jumping into the water in the daily. Oh, there are things you like. There was more to that challenge. It was not even shown. Like there was a moment when he yelled out to us that he was attacked by a shark as a kid. He said he doesn't remember saying that. So he was like, I was attacked. As a... So he like used that as an excuse for why he was not performing great. There was a moment where he climbed up on shore and did like this mermaid pose. Like, oh my god! We're all like Angela's over here busting her butt, and you're like, he's just like goofing off the whole time. Um, so yeah, there was much more to that challenge performance than was shown on television. Oh um, wow! Oh gosh, I hope they do a shit they should have shown. I hope they like do. the CBS version. You yeah, know what I mean, yeah, I, I would, I would love to see it because yeah, he acted up during that challenge. <laughs> that, that was a challenge where I was like, think. Goodness, Leo's not my partner. Um, <laughs> but I got him on a good <laughs> So I've actually got to ask, I know that in your initial CBS interview, you had said that um, the survivor you thought you were most like was Tasha. So I'm I'm going to say your season's name right with heroes, healers, hustlers, because before I said heroes twice, because it's the <laughs> hardest one to say out of the whole bunch. Yeah. But Tasha was from Brains versus Brawn versus Beauty. So neither of you are doing me any favors with the <laughs> alliteration. That's right, that alliteration, yeah. What was it like to be able to then play on the Challenge USA with the person that you felt you were most like from Survivor? Uh, I respect Tasha so, so much. Like as a Survivor competitor, as a woman, as a professional, like, I just have the utmost respect for her and everything she does and everything she stands for. Um, so yeah, before she went home, like I, they don't show a ton of like us communicating, but she was probably the person I trusted the most. Um, cause I feel like she's a woman of her word. She's a woman of faith. So I felt like she was a nice, my faith all the time. Um, and it was, yeah, honestly a dream come true. Like I had, I had had the opportunity to meet Tasha once before and she was like the kindest, sweetest person ever, which seems like it, it, she, it, it seems unreal. She seems unreal. Like that's how nice and kind and well put together she is. Um, but it was, yeah, to, to play with her, someone who I've always kind of viewed as a child, as survivor legend and yeah. will always view as a survivor legend was, was pretty amazing. Oh, I love that. I, I hated seeing her go out. It was, it was tough. And we, you know, we do the exit interviews. Um, and so we got to talk with her and with James and, um, she seemed like such a sweet girl. I loved her. I loved her energy, her vibe, like everything about her. She was, she was awesome. I, yeah, I, yeah. She's so nice and sweet. Like, yes. it like how, how can you be a real human? But she's, but it, exactly. She's a real human. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and that was my thing. Cause I'm like, she seems so like nice and stuff, but you know, like sometimes we're like, okay, is it just like, you know, because we're like the podcast and we're putting it out or whatever. But everybody that I talk to, they're like, no, that's just really how she is. Like, she's just, yeah. 
that's just how she is. I'm like, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. She deserves all of the great things in life because she's, yeah, a wonderful human. <laughs> so I have to ask. So uh, we actually, uh, and I think you saw it, we put up a question box on Instagram for some people to uh, submit some questions. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of the ones that were submitted by fans were ones that we already kind of normally ask about. Uh, but there was one that was submitted that was a little interesting, and and I kind of wanted you to a wanted to ask you about it. Um, so James actually submitted in, and he said, uh, "This is what his thing says." He says, <laughs> "Who's your favorite amazing racer, and why is it James?" Laffy face, love you so much, Desi. <laughs> so I just wanted to ask about yours and James's relationship on the Challenge USA. Oh my gosh, I I also loved like that was such a sad week, and I think you like. I think I literally surprised you as they were leaving. Yeah. Um, because James is kind of the same way. Like, he's such a ball of light and he's filled with so much love. And I um, actually met James like a week before we left for the show. I went to the Big Brother celebrity, oh, nice. whatever you call that, like finale party. Mm. Um, so, James was the first person I met at the party and we like sort of hit it, hit it off right off the bat. Um, so, when he was also at the challenge, I was like, oh, we're definitely going to work together. Like, we're going to go to the end together. And I also knew that he was a super fan. So he was like, he knew all of like the tidbits of information that I did not know. So yeah. I also felt like I really relied on him to like tell me the tea. Like, what was this person like on their original show? They, they're saying this to me, but like, what should I actually trust? Mm -hmm. um, so I love James in the house. So I've seen him multiple times since we've, you know, gotten back to LA. And I just, again, a great guy a great competitor um, and just so much fun. Like he just always was fun. Even when he was on the chopping block and like maybe going home, which we saw week after week after week, um, still just like always had a positive attitude. And that's something I really admire. Cause I, if I were in his situation, I did not think I would have been as positive as he was in those moments. I was going to say um, probably one of the most unentertaining eliminations the way they set it up but james and kayla made it the most entertaining yes. elimination i've seen when they were doing the spin class yes like that was fire i would join it yes I'd absolutely yeah. oh yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so fun to watch i mean it, it was shockingly like closer than i felt like it should have been because like they were booking it the whole time like honestly the other team not booking it quite i mean cashel was booking it but yeah anyway <laughs> we won't get into that um yeah, but fun to watch, like fun to cheer them on. And, and it was very clear, like who the majority of the house wanted to come back in. So that made it fun too to like see that they weren't down on themselves for, you know, losing their daily challenge and being in the situation that they were making the most of it. And, you know, either going to go out with a positive attitude or get back into the house with a positive attitude. And I love Kayla as well. Like all the oh, amazing yeah. racers are, are, are great people. So. It, it, it really surprised me how much game knowledge they had coming in. It's like they really did their research on every single show and every single person and they knew it. Like yeah. it was surprising because, you know, like I think the first interaction I saw with Kayla was with Xavier and she's like, oh, my God, I love the cookout. You guys were great. He's like, I'm actually wasn't a part of the cookout. And I, I got a kick out of that. I thought that was funny as hell. But, it was funny. Um, I, I, have funny. you guys talked to Kayla at all? We, Not yet. We've talked to her okay. online, but we haven't gotten to interview with her yet. She's she's so sweet, though. I love her. She's so sweet. But I, I would just say, like, the most, I think, like, outstanding thing about her story is, like, how quickly she came on the town. I don't know if she, she talked to you about this or you no. heard this at all. No. And maybe this is, like... Yeah, so she actually, I think, got the call. I want to say like six days before we left. Oh, oh wow! Oh, so like, like, like Aza, kind of like Aza, yeah, 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 kind of like Aza. Yeah, so it was wow. like a very quick turnaround between like when she was first asked about it and had to like get medical done and get psyche wow. valve done and then like act. So she had a super quick turnaround. So the fact that she came in like with so much knowledge yeah. is even more impressive because she had like zero prep time. Right. Oh, yeah. Wow. wow. Yeah, I didn't know that. I knew about Aza because I had heard Aza talk about it on the official challenge podcast. But yeah, I didn't know that about Kayla. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a, a question I like to ask every guest that we have. So stepping in the challenge house is, uh, challenge house is a bit of a pressure cooker, right? Because you walk in and there's anywhere between 28, I think, uh, total people on this season. Mm -hmm. Upwards on other seasons, you've seen like 36, 40 people on there. And obviously all personalities don't get along, but who was someone that you walked in the house thinking, I'm not going to get along with this person. And you actually became friends now since the show. Hmm. Um, I would say like, whew, uh, that's a really good question. I would say the, like the biggest shock to me was Sarah Lucina. Oh, really? I did not. I, yeah. I did not expect to 
like Sarah Lucina. Yeah. Just because I watched her play and I, part of me was also just like terrified of her. So I was like, oh, I'm going to create my distance with Sarah. Um, but actually, the, the night before the first challenge, I was like freaking out. A lot of us were. And they, they didn't really show this, but we were like all having individual conversations. Like, what are they going to make us do this tomorrow? Are we going to have to skydive? Am I going to go into elimination? Um, and I remember talking to Sarah like in the gym and she just sort of like talked me. I can't even remember really what she said to me, but she just like talked me off the ledge. She was like, this is only day one. Why would people come after you at this point in the game? Like they're, you're not going to be their number one target. Like just relax, enjoy, have fun. Like survivors have got your back. I don't like, we just had a really good moment on like day two. So I was like, oh, either she's playing me really hard. She's really good at it. <laughs> or like, this woman isn't as bad as she seems on TV. Right. So I'd say she was the biggest shock for me because I fully expected to dislike her and just have to like grin and bear it. Um, and I actually ended up enjoying her a lot. Oh, I love that. That's so cool. Yeah. I, I can, I can see it, like how she does have an intimidating factor that just comes across on television. <laughs> like I can imagine it's much more so in person. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but then like it, like I walked in because I've only seen parts of her on Survivor, so I had kind of a similar feeling. And then that like first, I think it was the first episode where you guys had to go down the side and oh, add yeah. up the math problems. And I think it was Shannon when she's like, "I'm so freaking nervous." And and Sarah looked over, she's like, "Oh, I'm terrified too." And then it cuts to her confession. She's like, "I've done SWAT repelling for years. It's no big yeah. deal." I was like, <laughs> right. Well played, well played. Yeah, well played. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Like I said, yeah, she could have just been playing me in that moment, but whatever. It worked. It made me feel good and comfortable, and maybe made Shannon feel comfortable too. So I, I yeah. would say, like, she's got a tough exterior, but she's also really good at like disarming you, which is probably why she's also a successful survivor player. Right? Yeah. yeah exactly. So, really quick, before we move on from from the challenge, I actually wanted to ask about this um, at the beginning of the challenge discussion, and I totally spaced it. But the algorithm. Let's talk about the algorithm. So. I'm trying to think back on who your original partner was that you chose on day one. Was it uh, Cinco? Cinco, right? Okay, that's what mm -hmm. I thought it was. So you chose Cinco thinking that you were going to play the game with Cinco as your partner. And then, you know, out of nowhere, TJ comes out with this silly algorithm thing and, you know, it throws the whole game plan off. How do you move forward from there? Is there still like alliances intact with the people that like with Cinco and stuff like that? Or is it just kind of played? where your alliance is your partner and who your partner is for that week and that's it? Or how are you kind of approaching that? Yeah, so I'd say it kind of varies from week to week. Like, yeah, obviously I was pissed when they unveiled this algorithm. Yeah. And I think we were all like collectively pissed. Um, yeah. And like funny enough, so Tiffany and I had had a discussion the night before the first challenge. Like, what if they let us choose our own partner? Like, who will you choose? Who should I choose? And we both kind of strategically were like, let's choose someone who's not on our original show and maybe it'll just give us protection, you know, outside of our, the original show line. Right. Um, so like my, my selection of Cinco was like a very calculated move. Like, you know, there were survivor players I would have loved to partner with. So I was like, let me get the shield of having a Love Island person on my team who also is good with Big Brother to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a very like calculated move. Like they, they don't show it, but like literally when he was like, you can choose your partner. I took a B line to Cinco and was like, hey, you want to be partners? <laughs> 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 and he had no choice but to say yes at that point because I was like in his face like please um, <laughs> right <laughs> right didn't give him an opportunity to like even think I like ran and was like it, like knew exactly where he was and I was like oh there's Cinco let me go back to him yeah um, <laughs> so when they unveiled that twist like it, it kind of blew up my whole plan in the game yeah um, and it did make it tough to always you know remain faithful to your alliance because you know there's a certain point in time where it's like I want to be loyal to you, but also like, I got to save my own butt um, this week. So it was tough. And I, I'm sure they did that on purpose. Otherwise we would have played probably on show lines the whole way through. Mm -hmm. um, whereas that added an element where we were forced to build relationships outside of our original shows and make other bonds and, and you know, prove ourselves in other ways. Um, so at the end of the day, I guess I became more comfortable with the idea. <laughs> but I, I, I still hated the algorithm and i think we all did because it just it was stressful <laughs> week after week after week like you know yes it's like start over and rebuild and start over and rebuild so yeah. um yeah definitely made the show more challenging i think from like a production point of view it's really smart because if they want to do 
not no no freaking clue what CBS and Bunim and Murray are trying to do. But mm-hmm. if they want to do additional seasons and bring back cast, not just the the competition of the world, you know, but like really have a, a long standing challenge USA. It mm-hmm. makes sense to make you guys make these different relationships. Yeah. Cause it'll build that storyline for additional seasons. I think Yeah, it makes sense. It, it, right, at least right. At least me sitting here talking it through, it does, but that doesn't mean anything. Right. And in retrospect, it probably worked out best for all of us because otherwise Tyson and Angela would have been partners throughout the whole season. <laughs> <laughs> and we all probably would have been screwed anyway. So <laughs> I guess in retrospect, like it wasn't so bad that we had the algorithm. Um, so it did level the playing field. Like, yeah, those are both tough competitors and then together week after week after week would have been a problem. Um, but it was still annoying in the moment. So I, I have two final things about the challenge and yeah, then yeah, I then no, uh, we'll we'll cuz I know we have a ton more to talk about. Um <laughs> well uh, other topics to talk about at least. Um, okay. but first one is 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 Tyson who he is all the time like we see him on the show? <laughs> Tyson is mostly who he is. I will say like he's very charming in real life and I feel like when I watch him in interviews cuz I've watched a few of his interviews, you know, pre-show and during the show I feel like I kind of hate him when he does interviews. Like, I'm like, this guy is super cocky. Like, why is he so arrogant? And he is like that in real life, but it feels, I don't know, more jovial and jokey. And now I'm realizing that, like, this is really how this guy feels about himself. Um, versus, like, this is just a show he's putting on to be funny. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, Tyson is Tyson is Tyson. But for whatever reason, like, that confidence is really charming in real life. But on this interview life, like post show, for some reason, it's probably the wrong way. If I'm being honest. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's understandable. Look, first episode when he comes out he's like that's how it's done tell your friends it's like yeah. whoa that's making a big <laughs> statement right away in the first challenge you just did math coming down a building Let's see what happens when he gets to a pole wrestle you know yeah uh, yeah true 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 um but the man is good at games i won't give him that yeah. like he, he was uh, i mean his whole life is playing games right he's yeah. like a pickleball influencer that's how he makes his money so like his, his whole life is games um which good for him like he has figured he has the cheat code he has figured it out but he's certainly confident. <laughs> love it. Love it. Uh, yeah, it, it, it seems to be kind of like a split in the fan base from like if if people saw him on Survivor and like follow him on IG and stuff, they're like, yeah, no, that's that's just Tyson. But like MTV Challenge fans who have never seen Survivor, they're like, who is this a hole like and i'm like it's it's fine that's just it's just, it's just, just like west don't <laughs> it's, worry it's yes <laughs> from survivor yeah. that's all it is yeah, exactly. essentially essentially yeah. yeah i'm like it's shocking to be that confident but like yeah when you can back it up it's like i can only say so much right <laughs> so my next question is Strictly hypothetical. Um, obviously, okay. we've only seen a few episodes. We don't know what you go, what happens, or what doesn't happen. But even going into the season, you know, nobody wants to go into an elimination. But if you were to, you've seen some of the eliminations. Which one that you would want to do? Would it be like a pole wrestle, or would it be like a puzzle? <laughs> you know, it would depend on who I'm going in against. Um, there were certainly some people I wouldn't have minded going into a hall brawl with. Um, but then there were others who I would be like a Sarah Lucina that I would have been terrified to go into a hall brawl with. Right. Um, so I, I would say I was, it, you know, hoping for a more physical elimination versus a puzzle elimination. I would say I'm the worst at puzzles, but I certainly don't think I'm the best at puzzles. Mm. So for my fate in the game to boil down to a puzzle, um, would have been or a trivia, which obviously I also spell that, um, <laughs> would have been terrifying to me right <laughs> that makes, that makes uh, yeah perfect i feel sense. much more confident in my physical abilities amongst that crowd than my yeah. trivia abilities and not to say i expected this answer but after cache gave the description of you reaching for some salt right? you know the other day so it was like <laughs> that's fair yeah yeah we all have our strengths and weaknesses right and i'm right. certainly not sitting around the house doing puzzles uh, right. but i do work out every day <laughs> well, i love it you know you you find that lane you stick in that lane right <laughs> exactly exactly maybe i should be doing more puzzles <laughs> you, when we get done i'll send you a great sudoku app all right, right. <laughs> yeah yeah please do 
<laughs> so I had some other questions away from uh, reality TV, but Tony, did you have anything else for Challenge USA or Survivor that you wanted to touch on? Um, I guess the only thing that we haven't really necessarily covered yet. Is there anyone that not even necessarily like from your season of Survivor, but just in general, was there anyone when you were thinking about the Challenge USA and you were getting ready to go out there that you either expected to see or that you were surprised you didn't see on the cast? Um, like a, a person you're saying? Yeah. Um, I mean, so, you know, we read the spoilers just like everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> so I certainly had like an idea of who was going to be there, but there were certainly people who were there. Like when we gathered at the airport, essentially it was the first time we saw each other. Right. And I was like, oh, like Ben, I had no idea he was going to be there. Tasha, I had no idea she was going to be there. Um, but I had heard like rumors about, I think Sarah Lucina was also a shock to me. Yeah, because I remember being in the airport like, oh, my God, that's there. It was like <laughs> shaking, literally shaking in my boots. I hope she's going <laughs> somewhere else. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Right. What is she doing here? A coincidence, <laughs> I'm <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there are people who I was told would be uh, that were maybe going to be there that didn't end up being there. I'm trying to think of who at the time. Now it all feels so long ago. Um, I know I can't even really remember, but yeah. I, yeah, there, there were certainly people who I expected to be there based upon the spoilers who weren't there. And then there were people who I were like, like there, why were, why didn't anybody tell me Sarah Lucina was going to be here? You're right. <laughs> this oh. wasn't the name on the list. <laughs> you, you don't, right, right. <laughs> this is not something you just walk up into. You yeah. need a heads up before I mean, you see Sarah. Preparation for Sarah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And I, and I felt like she was a, she's a big enough survivor name that like, she, nobody must have known she was going or else like the word would have you know, it would have leaked, I, I would think. Yeah, but, yeah, you would think, right? Oh, my gosh. Everybody else did, but uh, I'm like, oh, here, here I am with Sarah. <laughs> what happens next? Right. <laughs> I don't so, know if that answered your question. Totally. Totally. Okay. So kind of moving away from uh, reality TV, you also have a book uh, titled Love Affair With My Hair, Why Black Women Cheat on Health. Can you tell us a little bit about your book, um, you know, how you got into writing the book and, and publishing the book? Um, I know you're, you also have a co-author on it as well. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, so it's first cancel. Um, I will say, like, I enjoy writing. I've always enjoyed writing. I actually had a professor in college who, like, begged me to be an um, English major. And I was just like, what am I going to do with an English major? <laughs> Um, so I do. In <laughs> it does nothing for you. As <laughs> sorry, someone who's an English major, it does nothing for you. Don't be sorry. <laughs> sorry for all the English majors out there, but I was just like, you're, yeah, you're, you're not about the trap. If you're not going to be um, a teacher in English, it does nothing for you. I, I, I promise. I swear, Desi, if you say something about my interpretive dance degree, I'm really going to get upset. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to offend any English majors. I'm sure you guys have great careers, but like, you could have had any major, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, I do enjoy writing. Um, but I actually met my co-author. I, I can't remember if it was Miss Virginia at the time or Miss Virginia USA. But I met her at an event where I spoke and she, I don't know if she, all, I think she also spoke at the same event. And we just sort of hit it off. She had written, I think, two books before that. Um, and my platform at the time was all about, you know, encouraging people to be active. And as Black women, like there's a lot of Black women who aren't active, specifically because of their hair and wanting to, you know, maintain their hair. So it's also a lot to get your hair done as a black woman. Um, so she actually approached me about writing the book. So it was nothing that I had ever really thought about. But when she approached me, I thought like, yeah, this is a topic that I'm passionate about and I enjoy writing. So like, sure, I'll co-author this book with you. Um, so essentially the book starts by giving kind of like the background as to why black women and African American culture places so much emphasis in hairstyling. And it like roots all the way back to our lineage in Africa. Like that's how deep it goes. Mm -hmm. Um, so it kind of talks about that. It talks a little bit about like, why we're so addicted to the foods that we're addicted to and why like black soul food is what it is. It's all giving us heart disease and about diabetes. Um, but at the end of the book and kind of how it all sums up is uh, creating this 12 week workout routine that's scheduled around a black woman's hair appointment so that they can no longer use the excuse of like sweating their hair out. So it starts with like lighter workouts that wouldn't make you sweat as much so you're, you're able to preserve your hairstyle. And at the end of the week, it sort of ramps up your workout. So that the day before your hair appointment, you're able to get a really hard workout in, but then go back to the nutrition and get your hair done. Um, so it was really just a way for me to, I guess, kind of like put everything I've been talking into practice. Because um, like I said, my plat whole platform was around healthy living and getting kids and active through working out with their parents. 
Um, so to give like women a real actionable guide to learning how to incorporate physical activity and exercise into their daily lives without ruining their hairstyle because it is important. And, you know, it's something that culturally dates back hundreds of years. So I wouldn't expect for a woman to not find that important. Right. Absolutely. No, it makes, it's actually really, yeah. really well thought out. I yeah. mean, and, and by no means am I an expert in, in hair, you know, so um, <laughs> let, let alone a woman's hair or a black woman's hair. Um, but I, I know the importance of feeling confident in yourself and in your appearance and, yeah. you know, you being able to create that like guide of saying, Hey, look, this is how you can ramp up and still maintain that confidence, that appearance and still gain even more confidence by getting healthier yes. is extremely important. And, and, you know, I think that's extremely admirable. I mean, to do, obviously I'm, I'm sure you did do it for charity, but you still did it nonetheless. And mm -hmm. it creates an actionable plan for someone. And that's, that's really outstanding. Yeah. 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 I mean, we probably didn't promote the book as much as we should have. It didn't like take off, but it's out in the world as a resource. No, if, if anybody's looking for it. Well, we'll definitely yeah, we'll, make sure to link it. Yeah, we'll have it linked. Uh, we'll find all the links and we'll have it in our description box and, and all of that for anyone who who might be interested in that. We'll also put it up on our stories and in our groups and all that stuff. So the information will be out there if you guys are listening um, and you're interested in that. We will have the information out there. Um, and then the next thing that I wanted to talk about, because now this is something that I'm really interested in. You've also done a numerous um, presentations as a spokesperson, as keynote speaker um, for all types of different like health organizations and stuff like that. So how did you kind of get into that route? Yeah, so that actually, and this is kind of like a little known fact about pageants, um, but pageants really created that entire lane. Uh -huh. So as Miss Virginia and the Miss America system um, you're actually required to take like a year off of life. So I was in grad school at the time. I had to take a year off of grad school and you become like your whole job as Miss Virginia is just to travel around the state and give like do public appearances, give presentations, uh, like assemblies at school, go to senior centers, senior centers and give talks. So like literally my entire job for a year was just public speaking wow. um, and I have to like create wow. a new speech for this group of 65 plus and then tomorrow I'm talking to a group of three-year-olds um, <laughs> and then next yeah and then two days from now you're on the other side of the state talking to a high school um, so that's kind of what spurred all of that was just through the experience of being in Virginia because I, I did it all time for a year um, and then you know kind of becomes like a part of who you are so it's like oh well you know I've got 25 speeches written I might as well keep keep talking about this <laughs> right um, yeah. so that's kind of what spurred the whole uh public speaking was just competing in pageants and then of course i became a professor which also was nothing but public speaking right um, so it just sort of kind of naturally progressed but that's the start was just all from this virginia the so stage fright was never an issue for for you <laughs> oh i will not say that i still get uh, yeah no i get really nervous to the point of like oh wow i can't not like black out like pass out on stage right. um but there are like huge chunks of time in my life that i have no memory of because i get so anxious that it's like wow. i almost leave my body so i'm just like going through the motions but i'm not actually like experiencing the moments um so i actually worked with someone because it's it, like became an issue where you'll be like remember you did xyz and i'm like don't remember wasn't there like i believe you because it's on tape but like i i physically was not in my body um but actually while i was trained to become a teacher i worked with a woman who used this uh what's it called like protocol called brain gym mm -hmm. and it's kind of created to like tune you down to a certain extent where you can relearn like old behaviors and um so i worked with her actually to try to kind of overcome that where I could, you know, experience being nervous, but not be so nervous in the sense that like I am outside of my body. Um, so yeah, stage fright was a huge, huge, huge issue. Um, wow. I would say it was most severe when I tried to play piano on stage. That's when it like, became really apparent that like, oh, I'm not in my body. I don't know what my fingers are doing. And then this is not good when you're playing the piano. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I had to work hard to overcome stage fright. So yeah, not something that came naturally, but wow. something that and be improved upon. Oh, I love that. Actually, I really love that because again, it, it kind of goes back to, you know, what you were talking about earlier with being afraid of heights and just kind of doing it anyway. And I love that, you know, because uh, yeah, that was my bad for assuming that because 
that's always been my thing. I'm like, I've always had like really bad stage fright. I've gotten a lot better at it, especially since we, you know, I've gotten older and, you know, do the podcast and stuff. But, you know, when I was younger, like I did not like speaking in front of people at all. And I always, you know, would see like, I love keynote speeches and stuff like that. And I'm like, I love what these people do, but I could never do that because I have such crazy stage fright, especially with like a room full of strangers. Right. So I think that's, I think that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I think with anything, you just like jump in head first. And once you figure out that like you didn't think a few times and it's like, okay, I guess it's okay to be afraid and I can still do things even when I'm afraid of them. Right. Um, and I've kind of, you just have to do it over and over and over again. <laughs> and I good. still get nervous. Like I won't say I step on stage now and I'm just like totally relaxed. Like this is the most fun I've ever had. Uh, but I think it's, it's normal to be nervous. I mean, you care. Yeah. Um, and yeah. It, it, it usually works out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that whole line about picture the audience and the underwear does not work. That's no. That's, yeah. no. Oh, that, that doesn't I, work. Bad line. Bad line. Yeah. But you know what I did have to start telling myself is it, which I also actually think is true that when you're giving a public speech, speech, like people aren't hearing like probably more than 50% of what you're saying. Yeah. Right. So as long as you say a few good things and like repeat <laughs> those things a couple of times, like they're going to get something out of the speech because most of the words most of us don't have the attention span to listen to, you know, a 20 minute speech on stop. We're only taking on bits and pieces anyways. So. Right. Right. I, I've got to ask you now, Desi, when you do a keynote speech, are you one of those that say good morning? And then you wait for him to say it back and you're like, that wasn't good enough. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't know. I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to think I've, I've probably done that at some point in my life, but I remember dreading that in college. Like lady, we like, I'm here. Is that not enough? <laughs> like, yeah, I like, I'm, myself out of bed. I'm physically present. That should be enough. <laughs> right, you don't I'm need physically I, present. <laughs> right. Imagine me saying good morning back. Like okay, <laughs> yeah. you've got the microphone. Um, so I feel like I don't think I do that, but I, I, I'm sure I've done it before. Everybody's done it. And you know, yeah. it always falls flat. I did it one time at work and it just like, I was like, Oh, that was a mistake. I'll never do that. One. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Part of it is nerves. Like, oh, yeah. it's like stalling, oh. you know? Well, and that's what I was going to say. It's a, it's a horrible analogy, but it's, it's really like the first time, like having sex, right? Like you don't know what's happening. It's over before you know it. And then you're just confused after like, what the hell happened? <laughs> right. And, was that as fun as people say it was supposed to be? Right. Like, yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> was I audible? Did, did was people I actually did, did I talk to him this or, you know, right. <laughs> you're just like, you're like a confused patient after you're like, huh? I'm not yeah. sure what just happened, but <laughs> I mean, and I think that speaks to a character though, as far as being nervous about something and constantly trying to do it and improve upon it, it speaks to your character as a person. And, and I wanted to comment on this earlier and kind of tie it back to the challenges. One thing that I've been so impressed with is that none of you guys have quit any challenges mm -hmm. at all. And that's, that's something that we see uh, usually every season in the regular flagship. And the fact that and all stars and TJ called it out. You guys have some of the most heart that any of us have ever seen. And to hear that you've been constantly afraid at all these challenges, you still went through and did them. Yeah. Even when you're dangling off the side of a building <laughs> attached by a rope, which is impressive. <sighs> to yeah. you know getting in front of a group of people and speaking you know when it's a group of three-year-olds probably a little bit easier of an audience but you <laughs> right, know what right. I mean, you know but still to be able to get up in front of high schoolers who don't care you know what i mean it shows a lot of character and a lot of yeah. drive and it, it's no no wonder that you're you've reached a certain level of success with not only your professional life but also on reality tv and everything else yeah yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. And yes, yeah, it's not as easy as it seems like on TV, but you just keep pushing. And whether that be ego, I don't know what's motivating us, but yeah, we're, we're certainly a group that like did not quit on the challenge. And um, once everybody else does it, you're also like, I can't be the quitter. So. Oh, I can't be that one. Yeah, no. <laughs> right. that person. Right. That's worse and than doing it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, like if they're doing it, like, and I don't. That's worse than public speaking. Like, I'd rather right. give a public speech than that. Right. So, I, I just have my closing question, um, Tony. I didn't know if you had anything else that you wanted to touch on. Yeah, um, I was wondering if you could tell us more about your mobile home health agency. Mm, yes. Yeah, yeah. I love them. So Canadian of you, mobile. <laughs> 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 I love it though. <laughs> um, yeah, so I started the business about um, with, with a business partner about two and a half years ago. So kind of like right pre-pandemic, but it's a mobile physical therapy and occupational therapy company. 
So instead of patients having to travel to an outpatient clinic to get physical therapy or occupational therapy, we bring the therapy to them. Um, So it's been sort of a labor of love over the past several years. I would say like pre-challenge, I was working like 16 hour days and all day Saturday, um, just trying to like figure out all the intricacies of being an entrepreneur. Um, thankfully before I left, like we started hiring other therapists. So <laughs> it started taking the workload off of me actually doing the treatment. So by the right. time I was like the admin, I was doing the treatment, I was billing, I was like, I was marketing, like I was doing all of the things. Um, and going on the challenge kind of forced me to outsource some of those things and to right. bring on more people. Um, so yeah, we're operating in the greater Los Angeles area. Uh, we've got nine clinicians at this point in time. Um, so yeah, the business is going well. It's growing day by day. I am, I've learned so much, so, so much. Um, but it's been, yeah, it's been a labor of love and it's been a, a lot of fun kind of figuring out how to be an entrepreneur, how to be a successful entrepreneur, how to make money while also maintaining like the, the, the morals and the things that are important to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, it's called A plus care. I don't think I said that. A plus care. Perfect. We'll, we'll definitely link that as yeah, well. Yeah, we'll have that all linked down below too for anybody in the Los Angeles area. And that's just just to clarify, that's for like uh, recovery therapy and occupational therapy, not necessarily like sports physical therapy. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, we could do sports physical therapy. I will say a majority of our clients are like Medicare age. Yeah. Um, yeah. Our patients, our patients are usually either out of pocket or they're Medicare. Um, we do take Medicare. So most of our patients are Medicare. Um, so a lot of them are like, you know, post surgery or maybe they're having a balance issue or, you know, they've got back pain like everybody over the age of 45 has or <laughs> over the age of 40 has. Um, so, you know, we, we treat a wide range of issues. But I would say most of our patients are elderly. Fantastic. Well, I'm, I, I think that's a phenomenal, a phenomenal thing that you're doing as well. The idea of bring, yeah, making it mobile and not yes. making them come to you. Yes, exactly. I mean, yeah, that. yeah. We were kind of seeing like a gap in the industry, um, specifically like in home health, like home health that you get as soon as you're discharged from the hospital. Um, we also just got certified to be a home health agency as well, but we wanted to create like this continuum of care where patients could get discharged from the hospital have home health. And then most home health patients never transition to outpatients. They never truly become independent again. They just sort of like give up on physical therapy because they want to drive in LA to go anywhere, yeah. um, especially with physical therapy, which is like not generally <laughs> fun. Yeah. Uh, so we wanted to kind of close that gap in the industry and, and provide a service where you could transition from home health to outpatients with that still not having to drive through LA traffic to, to get your rehabilitation. That and it's going to be so motivating, awesome. too, because you you are actively going to them. So it's it's much more somebody is in this fight with you than you're having to do everything. You're having to go to physical therapy. But in this case, physical therapy is coming to you to help. Right, right. And it's, I also feel like it's better for the clinicians because I remember yeah. personally working at outpatient clinic where you'd have like four patients at once. And you're trying to like juggle all these four patients and figure out what you know, Mr. Smith is doing what Ms. Williams is doing all at the same time. Um, so it's easier as a clinician too to just like be focusing on one person and what exactly they need to do in that moment versus juggling four people and, you know, the crying baby in the waiting room. Right. Right. <laughs> no, that makes that makes perfect sense. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, and then it gives the clinician more of an idea in that relationship built with that that patient Mm -hmm. and more of an idea of like, okay, they are actually hitting real goals or maybe we need to adjust what their goals are because they're getting that one-on-one time. That's, that's really phenomenal. And if you need someone to write marketing pieces, let me know. I'm available at any time. Uh, that was a joke. No, that was a joke. No, you don't. Oh, okay. I'm like, is that real? Uh, <laughs> we'll will talk tell later. You. We'll talk later. Yeah. <laughs> um, actually, Desi, I do have a few questions, and this is a standard. I ask them to anybody who comes on that's been on the challenge. Um, but the little caveat is it's a two part now because I have to ask you about Survivor as well. But I won't go okay. as depth. Usually, I ask for a Mount Rushmore, but I'll go with the top three. If you want to give me. Not necessarily the top three best players, but your top three favorite players as, you know, a viewer watching of Survivor. Ooh. Ooh, this is hard. Um, definitely Sandra Diaz Twine. Oh yes. Great player. Love her. Um, I'd say three would be in my top three. Ooh, She's so her. good. Like I, I've only caught a couple seasons and she is phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I love her. And also just like a good person, I feel like. Um, I've not gotten the opportunity to meet her yet, but everybody who's met her like just gushes over her. And then who would my third be? I think maybe a Tony. I oh, think Tony you. is like epic, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm well played, uh, foreshadowing, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Season 43. No. Right. Yeah, um, can play. <laughs> <laughs> um, same thing, but for the challenge. And I, I know this is might be just as tough just because you have the, you know, the old school fandom and then obviously going back now. So, mm, I mean, I, I hate to say like the traditional people, but I think you have to say something. Yeah, I mean, West CT, I, I mean, Johnny Bananas, but I wanted, like, I also just really appreciate Car Marie as a competitor. I yeah. really, I really actually, I like Devon as a competitor. It's hard to choose three. Yeah, it, it is. It really is. We and love Devon. You know oh what? my gosh. We'll yeah. just, you know, we'll schedule another interview so we give you another <laughs> chance to give us three more people again. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Let's just make Mount Rushmore bigger. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's going to happen eventually. We need like so. 15 faces up there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, um, that's so, good for me. So uh, the last question that I have is one I like to ask everybody, um, but I especially have been looking forward to asking you this just because of everything that you do and everything that you stand for. Um, but when everything's said and done, when you retire and you shut off social media and all of that, what do you want people to remember about you and who you are? Mm, I, I think it's important for people to realize that we're all doing, not all, I'm just not, I can't say this for everybody. But me specifically, like I'm doing so much more than just reality TV. And I think that that's important for everybody to see, but also important for kids to see that like your whole dream in life cannot be to go on reality TV. Like that cannot be your goal. <laughs> right. um, you need greater goals. And, and that's kind of been every aspect of my life. Like even competing in pageants, I'm like, it'd be great to win, but if I don't win, this is my goal for this pageant. Um, so I would just, I just want people to realize that like, we're all doing like, it's, it's important to have goals and it's important to work towards those goals. Um, and it's important to be outside of your comfort zone. And I hope that like people can sort of take that from all of my experiences that like I have worked hard and I've been afraid, but I've done it anyway. Yeah. Um, so to take advantage of every opportunity that comes your way. And that's really how everything has happened for me. Like I didn't want to compete in pageants, but the opportunity came my way. I had to do it. Same thing with Survivor. Didn't necessarily want to be on Survivor. Opportunity came my way. There I was. Same thing with the challenge. But to say, like, I take every opportunity that comes my way and I make the most out of it, even if I'm uncomfortable. And I hope that that's what people remember or take away the most out of me and my journey. It's beautiful. I, I love, love it. it. I Absolutely. love it. That's awesome. Well, I mean, that's all I really have for this. But Desi, thank you so much. Like, it has been so much fun to sit here and get to know you and talk to you and, and learn more about everything that you've been through. Um, you know, and hopefully we can, you know, continue these little catch up chats moving forward and just kind of keep up with uh, all the amazing things that you've got going on. Um, we will link everything down below uh, when we release the episode. We'll release everything out to the fans. Um, and uh, yeah. And if there's ever anything we can do for you, you just reach out and let us know. I appreciate it. Yeah, you guys are super easy to talk to, and I appreciate oh, that. Oh, I was like, good. they're fans. What are they going to ask? <laughs> <laughs> we we try to we try to keep it somewhat highbrow, yeah. not not complete yeah. lowbrow, but we'll get there eventually. <laughs> but, but all right, Desi, you enjoy the rest of your day, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Thank you so much for joining. Amazing. Us. Thank yes, you guys. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. See ya. Thank you. Bye. Wow, that was really oh fun. My, oh my god! Sorry, yeah. I, I, she's fun. Like she's goofy and silly. I don't get that from her edit on 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 TV. Like she seems a get, lot more serious. You know? Yeah, you get that from her facial expressions on Survivor. Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh! Yes, the facial expressions on Survivor. Those are gold. But, so here's my thing with Survivor. Like I feel like unless they're like over the top personality, like Tyson, right? It yeah. doesn't really come across because they're under so much stress from not having food, not sleeping well, being in a competition where you get backstabbed. So you don't necessarily get that playful side all the time. It's hot, yeah. it's cold, it's raining, it's storm. Yeah. Like just, it, there's always a problem, you know? Now, and I would say, like, I've always liked Desi. I've always really liked Desi. Watching the season again in preparation for the podcast today, I didn't realize, and this is a testament to Desi as a player, 
I didn't realize how under edited she was. She was. Yeah. Because I always remember her as being like one of the top female competitors and one of the top competitors, period, from that season. Mm -hmm. But she doesn't necessarily get an overabundance of of airplay. Now, everything that she every time she's there, she's usually winning. Right. That's usually yeah. what you see in her <laughs> MO. Yeah. 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 But there's not a lot of of camp life, Desi, right. I find. Right. Um, yeah. And I don't like I mean, granted, she was on a tribe with Joe who did command like a lot of the, the screen <laughs> time because he was actively sort of pushing the narrative where he needed it to go. Mm hmm. But yeah, there, I've in this rewatch, I really found there wasn't necessarily a lot of camp life Desi, but I felt like I knew her very well going into the Challenge USA. Right. See, and I, I maybe that's why I felt like, you know, when I was like, oh, Desi went out so early. And then I started really thinking about it. I'm like, really, she didn't go out until like after the merge. She made it to jury. So really, she didn't go out early. It, it just I think maybe you're right. It felt that way because she didn't get a lot of airtime. Uh, on she was Survivor. day 21, yeah. Yeah, yeah. She was the first one in the jur of the jury members, right? Or I believe I so, yeah. I believe because she was the Jessica, first. Yeah. Jessica went out right before her and was not part of the jury. Correct. Um, so, yeah. So, Desi would have been first member of the jury. Yeah. Therefore, the mayor of Ponderosa. Yes, right? So, like, yeah, I think that the, maybe that's why it feels that way is because she didn't get a lot of airtime. Um, and like you said, what she did get, she was, you know, she was winning or talking about winning. But, like, hearing her talk about you know, when she was on her original healers tribe, sitting around the campfire, how they were always full, you know, they were always warm. They were always sleeping good. They were giving each other back rubs and stuff before bed. And like that, she genuinely had a really great time. Those first, like those first like two weeks or whatever it was when she was mm -hmm. just on the healers tribe before the swap. Um, like hearing her talk about that, I was like, why didn't we get to see any of this? Because we didn't see like any of that. I feel like on survivor and we should have like, I don't know why Do you know they why? don't show more of that. Why? Because they were winning. So because what happens after the after the challenge, you barely see the people who won because it focuses on the people who lost. Right. And they no, won that's... so consistently that really they didn't have anybody to like they didn't have any footage to show because they were always focusing on the other the other tribes. Well, and it's and that makes sense. I guess. It's similar to the challenge, because unless you're like Tyson, where you're completely over the top personality wise or Angela, where you're just, you know, you've been pegged as the main competitor. Or you know what I mean? How she has these first couple episodes. Middle pack people don't get a lot of airtime. Like we've right. seen Desi a couple times. She's had quite a, a, mm -hmm. a couple confessionals. But and I'm not saying like she's being shunned out like how they're doing David and Enzo. No, but we're also not getting. The same yeah, we're not getting the same airtime as Angela Tyson, Sarah. Well, not even Sarah, but like Alyssa, like those are the yeah. ones that are like really getting the airtime where we're catching bits and pieces with Desi. And mm -hmm. obviously we'll get to a point. They do it every season for every person on the show where they are kind of the star of that show, whether right. it's them either a like losing episode. elimination yeah. or winning an elimination or winning the daily and, and being the kind of the puppeteer of it all. Right. And, and we should, we'll get that moment with Desi, but even the little moments we've gotten have been impressive with her on the challenge. Yeah. You know, it, it seems like we've had this conversation before, but you know, all the folks from, survivors seem like they kind of came in with a leg up on everybody else in understanding yeah. what this game was and what they need to do to get further in it. Yeah. And yeah, I think Desi spoke to that really well when she talked about making that partnership with Cinco because, yes. you know, having that conversation with Tiffany, I, I believe that's who she said she had the conversation yep. with. I'm not hundred percent sure, yep. but uh, the fact that, you know, they were having that conversation, of we should partner up with someone outside of our group to really expand that. You know, it's a smart move mm -hmm. and it's it is it's an understanding of the game that not even people on the flagship that have done it two or three years really get. Well, and especially. Yeah. yeah, especially because the conversation happened before they even knew anything about the game. Like this was before TJ told them to pick partners or before they found out about the algorithm and stuff. So like yeah. she was thinking long term on day one. And exactly. that's what I like about Desi. Well, yeah. And, well, I mean, go ahead. Sorry. sorry. No, 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 I was go just going to I was just going to say, like, in her confessionals on Survivor as well. And it was another thing that I noticed on the rewatch. All of her confessionals are so calculated, like it's not convert, like a lot of the times they're conversational um, with the 
like with the camera, with the producers, whatever. Mm -hmm. Hers are very much like, here's the entire layout of how this game is going right now. Yes. And here's all the players. And you can you can tell like um, and I didn't mention it in um, in the interview just because I felt that I had already talked about Survivor enough um, (laughs) and didn't want to necessarily (laughs) continue on that train so that people knew that I did know other things. Um, (laughs) But one of the things that I found really interesting was like Desi was totally targeted because she was a physical threat. Oh, yeah. But if, if you look at the two people that were up for elimination that night when she went home, it was her and Joe. Mm-hmm. And Joe is like an incredibly strategic player. And I didn't fully remember that. I remembered um, more of like his out, like his that one outburst it was the one that I remembered yeah. more so than just how calculated he was like he had the whole game figured out as oh, well yeah. yeah but the issue was they could trick joe yep if they needed to they would be able to get one over on him they he hadn't won immunity yet and tended to go out f- decently early um in the individual ones whereas desi won the first one and came in third in the second one yeah so if there was going to be an opportunity to remove a strong competitor from the game, they can take Desi out this time and they will likely have another opportunity to take out Joe. Right. Whereas she very easily could have gone on an idle run. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Like an yeah. immunity idle win run. Y- yeah, absolutely. Well, well, and something I noticed, and I think it speaks to her, her strategy level as well. And, and I didn't see her. I, I did see her intro on survivor. I'm sorry, but I don't know if I remember correctly, but did she lead with the beauty pageant thing? I can't remember because I know on challenge she did. She yeah. led with beauty pageant, right? But yeah. that, like, that kind of gives you like a preconceived notion of Desi without if you don't know the fact that she's an act like a doctor as well. Right. You know what but I she mean? She was also right. she was also on the healer tribe, right? Right. Uh, yeah. Because she, so she came in as as a doctor. I'm just trying to grab the actual yeah. where what it stated as her profession. She was yes, yeah, her occupation was physical therapist. On okay. Um, on the show, like I, I knew that it wasn't beauty pageant, but I knew I couldn't remember if she had mentioned pageantry in the show. Yeah. Um, but she was put on the healer tribe. Yeah. And, and the reason I ask that is because on the challenge and obviously challenge and survivor are very different where I think challenge, it's very much more. I'm not going to tell my background so people don't have an assumption of like either I either a have money or don't or I'm either yeah. strategic or not. Right. Um, Like. For instance, Xavier last year in Big Brother didn't announce that he was a lawyer because that puts a target on your back right there. OK, so you know yeah. how to negotiate. Yeah. If And I think coming in as saying, oh, well, I'm also a doctor who, you know, specialized in physical well, I think, therapy. It I think would, Sarah's first season, she didn't tell anyone she was a cop, right? At she first. didn't tell anyone. She, uh, she didn't tell anyone she was a cop. I don't believe Tony didn't tell anyone he was a cop. He's yeah. a construction worker. Yeah, um, and actually, so, Chrissy, Chrissy on Desi season said she was a fi- um, didn't say what she did. She was a financial analyst because she said, mm-hmm. like, I don't want people to know. And then, like, I think it was the first individual immunity challenge. Um, Ryan went out within like two seconds. He was the first one out like immediately yeah. and he went and sat down. And then when Desi and Ashley were the last two standing, yeah. Jeff said, so Ryan has got, Ryan went out in two seconds. These guys have been up here for 30 minutes. How much longer has, have they been up there than Ryan went out and Chrissy just like threw out the number. And then later he asked another question that was equally complicated. And, and I don't mean like 28, like, I don't mean however many minutes and however many seconds i mean it was like 900 times longer than him or something like that right and then she he asked another question later and again she just like dropped it so even though she didn't say what she did she was showing she's still like she she still knows math anyway i didn't mean to cut you off i just wanted to point out that yeah like what kind of situation and the reason i brought that up is because i think it's smart to kind of go into the challenge and lead with that i don't know if she did that with the i I think she was just trying to make a mistake uh not a mistake i'm sorry i think she was just trying to make a joke because she was like you know i was miss virginia usa and now i'm gonna be miss challenge usa like I think yeah. that was more it. It wasn't necessarily about like trying to cover her actual like position. I think she was just like trying to be like start off what? like light and goofy because and maybe it does have to do with how serious she was portrayed on Survivor. And so she wanted to come out and just like, 
you know, be mm. like fun on the Challenge USA. I don't know. I, it, you know, it could be either way, but. Let me make Desi super strategic, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I want to make oh, her she fun. Is. Yeah, no, <laughs> she is. super strategic. Look, I, I, we didn't broach the conversation, but that, but the discussion that was had, um, I believe it was episode two. Um, where it was all the survivors sitting there talking about the big brother and, and, and not even in one person in, in particular, but just the discussion of how the shows were laid out. I mean, you could yeah. see that she, that she had a very firm grasp of where things lied, where they were going to potentially go and, and what was the best, best way around that, you yeah. know? So yeah, she had a roadmap. Yeah, exactly. And, and typically the most successful players have that they're oh, just yeah. you know the the difference i think between successful and championship players are which one can adapt to that roadmap when it goes haywire but <laughs> yeah because um, it will <laughs> it will go haywire but you know it was really interesting hearing about you know her journey towards reality tv and and yeah. how unexpected it was just very much how like the beauty pageants were kind of unexpected to go yeah. that route it's, yeah it, it very much reminds me of a churchill quote that like you know at a given time in everybody's life, you're going to get tapped on the shoulder for something that you are specifically tailored for. And yep. it seems like every time that tap on that shoulder came, she was ready. Yes. You know, yeah. And, and, and I so love, kudos to her. I love that. I love that. She's like, you know, if the opportunity's there, like I'm going to take it, even if I'm scared, even if, you know, like whatever, even like with her book, you know, she was like, yeah, I enjoyed writing and stuff, but like, I'm not, a, I'm not an author, you know? And, this opportunity presented itself to her while she was out, you know, working, the, doing all her work for the pageants and stuff. And she took the opportunity and, you know, is now a co-author, like, or a co-published author on a book that means something to her. And, you know, that's just, I, I just love it. It, it. Talking to her more and learning more about her whole journey through all of these amazing things that she does has made me love Desi even more than I thought that I could. <laughs> um but yeah, I mean, she's, she's just, she's such an awesome person. And it, it feels like she's got such a good balance in her personality. Like she's fun and sweet and stuff, but she also doesn't take no shit. Like you're going to get out there and you're going to do what you need to do. And there's no excuses for it. Um, you know, but she's goofy still. And, you know, she jokes and she laughs and I, I loved seeing that side of her. I'm going to add one more theme before we start kind of closing out because I feel like we're we're coming to the end of I this. I feel like we could babble about Desi for like all yeah. day. So, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. But, but the one thing I am going to say and like, look, I it's, especially with women competitors, I try not to focus on looks, right? Mm -hmm. Or body or anything like that. It's hard not to. It's hard not to because she's, she's, she's stunning. absolutely stunning. But stunning. she's wearing a tank top during our interview and all I could see were her fucking traps. <laughs> really though right. like <laughs> those traps and all i kept thinking the whole time is like who would win in a pole wrestle you or tori deal dude she was just sitting there and just the cut in her shoulders i yeah. was just like looking at her shoulders the whole time like ah, jesus man i'm like trying to hide my arms and stuff like and then i started thinking about like <laughs> What about like her and Cam in her prime? Like, Ooh. I want to see that one too. Like, like I, all I want to see Desi do is just wreck some fucking people. Like, right? but you know, I uh, guess we're going to have to wait for that. Yeah. I don't know. I hope we get it. I, that would be awesome. Um, but yeah, that's definitely, definitely something I would love to see. Shoot. Put her in there with Kara. Give him a poll. Let's go. <laughs> it's funny. It wasn't until I started to say the name of her season that I remembered that her season is the most I, it's the one season I've never been able to say properly, like at all ever. <laughs> and then as soon as I started and then after I finished, I was like reasonably sure I said heroes twice and then <laughs> didn't say healers, which was the actual tribe that Desi was on. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> because it's always it's actually the verses that throws me off. I can say heroes, healers, hustlers, no problem. But when it's heroes versus, and then it goes all down. Yeah, I just, I just want to see if I can do it. And Tony can't since he gives me so much shit about two guys that watch cartoons. <laughs> do that for you. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Um, heroes versus hustlers versus healers. Nope. No. Oh, I is mean it heroes versus healers? Uh, Versus Versus Versus. Yeah. unique new york unique new york <laughs> guys and that's, that's the thing then i had to do it at the end because i had to i had to correct it <laughs> correct it but i also had to show that i could <laughs> because in, in my head i was like 
how did I mess that up? And then I thought it was like, oh, because I mess that name up every single time that I've ever said it. And that's why I call it season 35. Yes. <laughs> Tony's over there. Don't be Rick. Don't be Rick. Don't say two guys, <laughs> cartoons, <laughs> dudes. dudes, dudes and cartoons. Guys. Well, and then I followed cartoons. it up with brains versus brawn versus beauty. So I yeah. wasn't much better. <laughs> off. Yeah, well, you know. We all have our off days, but we do. <laughs> you know what, guys, that's going to wrap it up for us here at the Challenge Fandom Podcast. We want to thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, we had a great time speaking with Desi. She is an absolute gem. And if you guys ever get a chance to watch her season of Survivor yes. or you want to go back and watch the first four episodes of, well, the beginning episodes of Challenge USA, I don't know when this is coming out. So. <laughs> <clears throat> Make sure you guys check her out. She's phenomenal. And we hope you enjoyed this interview as much as we enjoyed doing it. Yes. Um, and also, if you get a chance, check out some of the links below. Um, if you're in the L.A. area and you're looking for some physical therapy, I could think of no one better to recommend than Desi and her business. And we'll have that link below as well. Uh, if you are interested in her book, guess what? Link below as well. Boom. Instagram do. down below. Yep, we're going to link it all. Twitter? I don't know if she has one because I don't use Twitter, but it'll be down below if she does. We'll find it. I believe it's Desi <laughs> J. Williams. I think I think she does have Twitter. I just, I, I don't ha I don't use Twitter, guys, so. So there you go. <laughs> but for all of us, myself, Ricky Hayes, my beautiful wife, Karina Hayes, who does all the editing, Tony, stats, and motherfucking info, Lance, coming in hot. We want to thank you guys so much for tuning in. If you get a chance, rate us five stars. If you're going to rate us less, just don't do it. Go rate somebody else less. We love y'all. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Later. Bye.